10th, 2021. And welcome to all who may be watching or listening or participating uh, in our virtual meeting tonight. Uh, as always, I will start with a roll call of the board members that are present. Hal Holstein. I'm present. Karen Holweg. Here. Dave Kuntz. Here. And Caroline Miller. Present. And I'm Kurt Brown. So Leah, we have all board members present tonight. Uh, just a quick agenda preview for folks. Uh, we do not have a public hearing scheduled on the agenda tonight. So you are welcome to address any topic that you want to discuss during our public comment period. Uh, that could be including even the board's discussion of the Sea of South annexation at our recent study session. The public comment will occur shortly following the approval of the minutes. And at this point, I turn to Allison to go over the rules of the meeting and the process for signing up to speak during public comment. Allison. Okay, thanks. Let me share my screen. So you can see those slides. So thanks for joining us tonight and to strike a balance between transparent engagement and online security, we uh, ask that the following rules are applied to this meeting. And this meeting has been called to conduct the business of the City of the Boulder and activities that disrupt, delay, or interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. And no person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, in this case, Kurt. Each person shall register to speak at this meeting by using your, your full first and last name. So if you've joined the meeting, um, sometimes it will appear like Tom's iPad, and we would ask that you rename yourself before we can unmute you to speak. And you can also um, send me a message in the chat if you don't know, and I can rename for you. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All other participants will be voice only. And the person presiding at this meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates these rules. The chat function is enabled to me, it will come to me only, and the chat is for technical Zoom-related questions only, not content questions. Thank you. And only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during this meeting. Okay, uh, thank you. And at this time, Allison, how many folks do we have signed up? No one signed up in advance. Our attendance is diminishing. <laughs> uh, well, we will check back with you after the minutes uh, to see if uh, there are folks that are signed up. So thank you for taking care of that. At this point, we will review and approve the minutes from our last uh, formal board meeting, which was January 13th, 2021. And so I will entertain corrections, um, adjustments to the meeting starting on page one. And just uh, board members, raise your hand if you have a correction. I do not see anyone raising their hand for page one. I will go to page two, which is very brief. Yeah, Karen. Uh, Karen, yes. I would like to make a, the addition of a phrase on page one in the first paragraph of agenda <clears throat> item four, um, where it says the board asks clarifying questions about. Um, I went back and I checked the, the recording um, to make sure that my um, addition is accurate with the video. And uh, at some point in that sequence of phrases, I would like to add the phrase, how many visitors the system can accommodate and still sustain the system's ecosystem health? Do you have a suggestion where you would like to, I mean, you could make it a, an additional sentence at the end, uh, 
just because it's fairly long, uh, whatever your pleasure is. Well, in the recording, it came right before comparing ecological data with social data. So perhaps that's the place to insert it. Okay. Do you want to read it one more time to make sure Leah's got that? And why don't you read a couple words before it too, so we know where you're at. Uh, data considering additional times of day and specific locations, comma, and then insert how many visitors the system can accommodate and still st sustain the system's ecosystem health. Leah, do you think you have that? She always does. Okay. Um, any other proposed changes to the minutes? First page or second page, anyone? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, so at this point we will vote uh, to approve the minutes of January 13th, 2021. I will call the roll. Hal Hallstein. I approve. Karen Holweg. And I'm sorry, this is as modified by Karen's amendment. Karen? Yes. Dave Coons? Yes. Caroline Miller? Yes. And I, Kurt Brown, vote yes also. So the minutes are approved unanimously. <clears throat> Tremendous. Um, before we move into the public comment, um, we would like to read a proclamation from the Open Space Board of Trustees, if people will give me one moment. The proclamation is called a proclamation recognizing the dedication and volunteer service of Kurt Brown to open space and mountain parks from 2016 through 2021. Kurt Brown joined the Open Space Board of Trustees in 2016 and began a tenure that would help open space and the mountain parks department through many significant achievements. Kurt has shown a passion and commitment for open space through his leadership, his knowledge of the OSMP system, and his thoughtful representation of community interests. Kurt was instrumental in providing meaningful guidance for many significant achievements, including the completion of the Agricultural Resources Management Plan, updates to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan, and integrated site plans for Gun Barrel Hill the Gebhard property and Wonderland Lake. Additionally, his board tenure involved the acquisition of four large historic ranch properties in the Boulder Valley, Shanahan Ranch, Boulder Valley Farm, Fort Chambers Poor Farm, and Lippincott Ranch, in addition to several smaller priority acquisitions, ensuring over 1,450 acres of land are protected in perpetuity under the OSMP system. A legacy achievement during Kurt's time on the board was the completion of OSMP's first overarching master plan, framing and guiding the future management of open space lands in a manner that reflects the community's hopes and dreams for the future of open space and mountain parks. Kurt played a key role in the process as a member of the master plan process committee. Together with staff, the process committee guided a multifaceted process that included seven community events, two drop-in listening sessions, statistically valid community survey, online questions and responses, two study sessions with city council, and more than a dozen meetings and study sessions of the Open Space Board of Trustees. Kurt and the process committee emphasized that staff conduct targeted outreach and engagement to reach voices that might not otherwise be heard, resulting in more than 10,000 comments, including members of the Latinx community, youth, and per persons experiencing disability. Kurt showed constant support to the staff working on the master plan, um, the best it could be demonstrating his ability to work collaboratively with others, lifting us all up. Kurt's leadership role as board chair over the past year perhaps will stand alone as an unprecedented and unique circumstance in that the department and community had to adapt and navigate through COVID-19 pandemic, requiring all board meetings to be managed online and virtually. This resulted in not a single meeting during his time as chair taking place in the council chambers. <laughs> Instead, Kurt had to use his own home and chair 
to chair <laughs> meetings while being compassionate to the challenges and constraints everyone was experiencing in coping with this pandemic. Yet during this challenging time as board chair, he provided excellent leadership to the board and staff in managing challenging discussions, including the expedited review of prairie dogs on irrigated agricultural fields and the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation project. His even-handed and inquisitive approach helped move these and other projects forward for the department in positive ways, adding value to the work of staff. Since 2016, Kirk contributed over 1,200 volunteer hours serving on the Board of Trustees on the accomplishments listed above, to which OSMP staff and the community are greatly appreciative. Therefore, I, Hal Hallstein, Vice Chair of the Open Space Board of Trustees, do hereby proclaim that the leadership exhibited by Kurt Brown over these past five years has been instrumental to the success of this board and the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. Proclaimed this 10th day of March in the year 2021 on behalf of the full Open Space Board of Tr Trustees and the Open Space and Mountain Parks Department. Um, thank you so much, Kurt. And um, I also wanted to read a, a short um, message related to a gift um, for your service, which is a beautiful photograph taken um, of the flat irons with a, a moon behind it, provided graciously by Rich Wolf, a photographer of our system, who also sent his appreciation for what you have done um, with this board to manage our precious open space and his uh, happiness to be able to offer this image um, to you on the department's behalf. Well, thank you, Hal, that's wonderful. And thanks to all of you too. It's, uh, it's been a very interesting year, but uh, it's been a great year. And um, all I can do is say thanks to all the board members and staff for making challenging circumstances uh, manageable. So. Uh, really, I, I appreciate it. In, in spite of the interesting and sometimes difficult issues that we've had to deal with, uh, we've made it all work. And I, uh, I just greatly appreciate the staff support all five years uh, and this board particularly over the last year. Um, <clears throat> I think this is where I get to make recommendations for the future. I think Tom did. And um, so I think this year has been interesting, but I think it's better to meet in person. <laughs> That's just my impression. I think you might think about that them. going forward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I don't want to criticize, but during this last year, the quality of the food that we have before our meetings has really gone <laughs> downhill. Uh, so I just have to say it. Um, I, I actually do have one substantive recommendation. Uh, and, and that is something that I think we've been moving towards. And so I, I would recommend that from the first meeting of the term that both the chair and the vice chair participate in the agenda discussions. I just think it's really valuable. Uh, I know when uh, I was participating during the latter half of Tom's uh, last term as chair, it really helped me. And I think it would prepare it would mean that the vice chair would always be knowledgeable and ready to step in if necessary for the chair. So that would be my one substantive suggestion is to, uh, is to consider that going forward, but obviously that's up to the board. <clears throat> so thank you again. That was a, a wonderful uh, commendation and I really appreciate it. Uh, Kurt, with your forbearance. Yes. If, if I could uh, say something, uh, Tom Isaacson uh, couldn't be here tonight, but asked me to read an appreciation um, for you. And so if, if that sounds okay, I will do that. Well, thank you very much. Kurt, congratulations on finishing your five years on the board. The city and the open space system are far better off as a result of your commitment and hard work. Many tough issues, including Prairie Dog, CU South, the Master Plan, and others, have been tackled during your time. Throughout all of it, you've been a voice of thoughtful, informed, and sensible guidance. You were always able to stay calm, focused, and good-humored during these discussions. 
But you never fooled us with your modesty and self-effacement. You knew exactly what you were talking about. You exhibited the best traits of a trustee. Although you had a clear perspective, you helped avoid needless contentiousness and instead worked constructively to find compromises that received and deserved broad support. You helped bring the board together. You even led the board to a five to zero vote on a mountain biking issue, a vast improvement over the three to two votes that previously had plagued us. Mm. During my time as chair, I was especially grateful to have your wise advice on a wide range of planning and substantive issues it made those years immensely easier and more enjoyable. We should all be grateful for your service. Good luck with whatever comes next for you, Tom Isaacson. Well, thank you, Dave. That's really wonderful. And you know, uh, the best preparation anybody could have for being chair is to serve as vice chair for two years in a row under Tom Isaacson. <laughs> <laughs> so that's awfully kind of him to say those things, but uh, he, he made it very easy, so. Anyway, but thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. Well, and I'd like to add uh, just a, a quick comment to, to that as well. And, and basically, um, I'd like to add my appreciation of, of your dedication on an, analyzing issues and tenacity in getting to common understanding and ground. Uh, I think, uh, you know, during the tenure I've, I've been here, it's been rewarding to work with you and uh, all of us have appreciated it. And Hal, I think your proclamation uh, was excellent and right on and thanks for doing that. And thank you, Kurt, we'll miss you. Well, thanks to all of you. And I uh, just I just wanna briefly add before we move on um, that it's amazing how much we needed your dam expertise. <laughs> uh, not knowing five years ago when you were appointed. You how didn't about, put God in front of that though, <laughs> God, even though you know. might have thought so. <laughs> and I'm surprised nobody has mentioned your attentiveness and great ideas with the Junior Ranger program. Um, but I, I really appreciate all that you've done for the open space system in the last five years. Uh, you've really done a heavy lift of, of great service to the community and to our open space system. And best wishes to you as you expand your grandfatherly role. Yes, that's right. We're having our second grandchild born tomorrow. So this is an interesting transition. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Uh, I really appreciate that. Well, uh, does Kurt, this take us? I'll, I'll, I'll chime in from the staff perspective. So you and I have an interesting beginning in that I actually, my tenure started on leap year, February 29th, 2016. So I got you by a month, a month. <laughs> of but uh, um, so we, we kind of came in together and uh, so you've been with me every step of the way. And I just want to say, I know from a staff, full staff perspective that, you know, what makes a really great partnership between a board and a staff. And I've had the privilege of working in, in leadership roles with boards for, for most of my professional life is, is, is the level of respect and approachability. And, and you, you, you are very approachable. Uh, a staff never, um, um, uh, we look forward to discussions with you. Uh, we, uh, you're, you're very respectful um, of staff. And, and, and just like with Karen and Dave saying and the proclamation, your knowledge base is, is really out of the park. And, and of course, adding that to the knowledge base of staff is, is I think what the board's um, really lift is, is putting all this community, community knowledge together. And uh, <clears throat> So I just personally just really have appreciated the last five years. I can't believe it's 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 happening quickly. That means that I've been here for well over five years now too. So on behalf of the staff, um, we're going to miss you. And uh, uh, again, we just really have appreciated your approachability and your respect and uh, and and your knowledge. So thank you. Well, well thank you, Dan. And I, I have to say that we've worked on some really difficult issues over the last five years. But I have never once seen any hesitation on the part of the staff to engage with us, to provide information, to support our questions and our need for understanding, even when we were bringing up really difficult issues. And that's, 
that's really the measure of a staff that goes beyond what their job description is. And, you know, all of us know how difficult it's been for the staff this last year and how crazy it's been for everybody. And they've always remained positive, as have you and your, your leadership team. And that's, that's a real testament to uh, your commitment to both the system and, and the city and the citizens of Boulder. So anyway, thanks. It's made it really enjoyable even through the most difficult issues. So thank you. Uh, I think that takes us to the public comment. So Allison, I turn back to you and where are we? Okay, thank you. So some people have joined since um, my spiel at the beginning of this meeting. So if you would like to participate in public comment, you can raise your hand now and I'll just go in order that I see the hands. If you open your participants box, the little icon down at the bottom, you should at the very bottom of that box have um, a button to raise hand or sometimes it's appearing in the reactions icon also at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, you should also have the ability maybe to raise your hand. So both of those work. I see a lot of first and last names. So everyone looks in good shape if they do wish to speak and I'm not seeing any hands raised. So we'll give, okay. it, give it one more second to see if anyone's, and if you're having any issues, oh, okay, we have a hand. I was also going to say, you can always chat chat to me too and, and let me know that way too. <clears throat> so we do have Lynn Siegel. So Lynn, um, you can unmute yourself and Leah will start the time and just state your first and last name, please. Oops. Can you unmute Lynn? Yeah, can you hear me? <coughs> yeah, you're really quiet. Yeah. Um, I planned to the Mac um, because the Mac works fine except for my audio thing. So, so I don't know how well you're hearing. I can barely hear Lynn. Is anyone else hearing Lynn? No, I barely uh, hear her. Okay. Lynn. Yeah, we're we're just not getting anything. Yeah, I did. I stop allowing development. We have too many demands on open space for seeing south, or for water view, or for all development. Uh, Lynn, Lynn, this is Kurt. I'm I'm sorry. We've got a technical issue, and I guess what I would ask you to do is. Um, if, if you can't change thing, the setup right now is to just uh, send the whole board an email with your comments. Chat. Could you check the chat? Chat. We we're, we're, don't see anything in the chat window. I, I guess uh, we'll have okay. to go. We'll have to go on, Allison. Do we have anyone yeah, else Lynn, signed up? Yeah, Lynn. Lynn um, put in the chat to me. Stop allowing development. Okay. And, um, and and I would again ask Lynn to, you know, write down any comments she was going to give and and send it to the whole board, and we will treat it as her public comment. Okay, and that's good. And um, she's also saying in the mm -hmm. chat not enough open space for water view and eb so um lynn if you um can hear us just please email the board your comments and i'm not seeing any other hands raised okay well uh thank you allison then we will go on to the next uh item on the agenda which is matters from the department and i will turn it to dan yeah, thank you, Kurt. So we have um, 
our major item under matters is to provide the board with an overview of two of our initiatives uh, involving our work with um, uh, tribal nations. Um, and so just a little bit of background, we provided you a pretty extensive memo on, 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 on various aspects of our work with in tribal relations. Um, we, uh, that is also going to be used as a template to uh, provide council with a memo uh, in the upcoming weeks. So there's a, there's a lot more information in there than we have planned to verbalize tonight. So after uh, Phil gets done with his portion, which will be after mine, uh, we'll open it up for any questions that you have on, on the issues that, uh, or the initiatives that um, I update you on and that Phil does. But if there's any other questions you have about in the packet, um, I'll also just mention that Christian Driver is also uh, with us tonight. And so between the three of us, hopefully we can answer any questions you have about our tribal, the city's tribal relation work. So uh, like I said, the memo that we prepared has a lot of details and information on, on a host of projects and initiatives that are ongoing or underway. Some of them have been underway for many years. Other, one, other, other, other of them are pretty fresh. All are designed to strengthen the city's relationship with tribal governments and indigenous peoples. Um, our goal for tonight is to provide you with an update on uh, uh, that's a little bit more focused and that'll be on two areas. First, I'm, I'm going to provide you with an update on our formal tribal city consultation efforts. And then Phil Yates will join us and he'll provide you with an overview of the process framework and timeline that the city is city staff is using to guide the development of a land acknowledgement. So first we'll uh, uh, touch upon tribal consultation. So in your packet is a really great guide on what tribal consultation is. It was authored by Ernest House, who is actually a, a consultant to the city of Boulder on tribal relations and authored a great book on tribal consultation. So if you haven't had a chance to skim that or read that over, um, I encourage you to, but it's a really informative document. But in a nutshell, Tribal consultation is broadly defined as a process of meaningful government to government communication and coordination between government agencies and tribal governments. And typically they happen prior to an agency that is taking any actions or making any decisions that may affect tribes or tribal interests. You know, and although consultation was originally established as a federal government policy, since then numerous states and a few select municipalities have also sought to use consultation uh, in order to gather input from tribal governments when their own actions are thought to affect tribal interests. And uh, I'll just make just there is no law that is actually requiring the state or local governments from conducting consultations. And I, uh, I know in talking with Ernest that the city of Boulder is one of just a handful of municipalities that uh, has a rich history of consultation work. Mm -hmm. And that history is actually dating back to the late 1990s and into the early 2000s. And that's when the city of Boulder and tribal nations consistently held consultations. And what emerged out of these meetings were a series of memorandums of understanding. And then around the great time of the Great Recession, 2008, 2009, discussions and consultations ceased. And they weren't picked up again until 2019 when the city hosted a two day consultation that was attended by over a dozen tribal nations. A 2020 uh, consultation was, was scheduled to continue the discussions, but as we all know, in March 2020, when the consultation was scheduled to happen between the city and over a dozen tribes, that had to be canceled due to the onset of the pandemic. And it was actually the first, I think, formal meeting that uh, was canceled as a result of, of uh, the pandemic uh, sort of ensuing in some uh, health orders beginning on March 13th. The thought at that time was that we would post consult, uh, postpone consultation until, until 2021. So in order to gauge tribal interest in holding a consultation in 2021, we coordinated a conference call with tribes on February 18th. And really the goal of that call was to uh, discuss their interest in holding a consultation soon, in which that would need to be a virtual format on Teams or Zoom, or do we hold off until we we're able to meet face to face? which if, in that, if that was the case, probably wouldn't happen until late 2021 and probably more likely in the 2022 timeframe. 
it was pretty much a unanimous decision from the participants on that phone call that there was strong interest in continuing the 2019 discussions sooner than later, and thus to hold a virtual consultation and to do so as soon as we uh, as soon as possible. So what we're doing now is we're now working to confirm uh, a date and uh, and whether or not uh, a tentative April 7th date is a date that will work. Um, it hasn't been confirmed yet. We're going to have a meeting with staff, staff later this week in which we might have some more information that might uh, feed us some more definitive on that. But uh, right now, that's a tentative date. And the focus of this upcoming uh, consultation is likely going to focus on three subject matters, two of which were the uh, subject matters of 2019. First, the name change of, Set uh, of Settlers Park is called for in the 2016 Indigenous Peoples Day Resolution. And second, continuing to discuss how best to update the existing MOUs that exist between the city and over a dozen tribal governments. The third subject is going to be a new one that wasn't discussed before with the tribes, and that is getting some initial uh, feedback from the tribes on the city's desire to develop a land acknowledgement statement or statements. So I'm going to just provide some background, uh, quick background on two of the three subjects, and then Phil will join us to provide you uh, the process framework for how we are thinking of working through uh, the land acknowledgement initiative. So first, Settlers Park, um, and this may be familiar to some of you, so, but just to refresh it, because in the next month we could be in consultation and it's just a good time for all of us to uh, refresh ourselves on these things. The 2016 uh, People's Day, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day Resolution states, and I quote, in recognition of a memorandum of understanding the city entered into with indigenous tribes concerning open space lands, the city requests input from representatives of those tribes and other interested parties regarding the name that commemorates the indigenous presence on parkland known as Settlers Park. The resolution also stated that the city manager consider any applications submitted to rename the parkland based on the input of indigenous tribes and interested parties. So the name change was a topic at the 2019 consultation, as I mentioned, and discussion uh, at, at that consultation closed with representatives agreeing to discuss the name change with their governments. The cancellation of the 2020 meeting really prevented further discussion of a proposed name change, and that is what we expect to bring back up for essential discussion uh, next month, hopefully. So after a possible name change process is complete, and that process includes completion, submission, and approval of a name change application that the city uses for name change, OSMP anticipates beginning to change infrastructure in the area to reflect the new name. So the second major focus of the upcoming consultation will be on the updated memorandum of understanding. The city of Boulder currently has several legal agreements, and I believe copies were in your packet or a link to them uh, in your packet with 13 federally recognized American Indian tribal nations. And these agreements resulted from formal city consultations in the late 90s and early 2000s. Just a very brief history, consultations initially began um, with the proposed construction of the NIST building in the city of Boulder on, on Broadway in the 1990s. And this was formal con conversations between the federal government and tribal nations. And, and out of that uh, came a 1998 memorandum of agreement between the government and the tribes. And that agreement, among other things, agreed to set aside uh, a portions of that property for permanent protection through a conservation easement agreement. And that conservation easement agreement is held by the city and the city of Boulder's Open Space Mountain Parks Department actually has responsible, responsibility to oversee, manage, and, and make sure the terms of that agreement is upheld in perpetuity. So the city have joined these early negotiations. And then after this NIST agreement, uh, agreement, we continued to have consultations independently of the federal government with the tribes. And that became uh, several uh, other memorandums of understanding. And, and in a nutshell, uh, what uh, some of these common uh, held beliefs that we have with the tribes were that preserving open space and cultural resources on city land is important providing opportunities for tribal members to access uh, uh, open space and, and practice ceremonial uh, and have ceremonial practices. 
establishing yearly government to government consultation goals when financially feasible. And finally, establishing a procedure to notify the tribes if Native American cultural resources are inadvertently discovered on OSMP lands. So bouncing ahead to 2019, uh, uh, what, what came out of that is we determined and agreed that the existing agreements should be updated and ideally consolidated into one MOU. So it's easy to, easier to track as new representatives and new staff uh, come onto the scene that we're not tracking back several agreements, one of which was amended a couple of times. So the goal would be, can we put these all under one umbrella? Also recognize that there's several new issues that, uh, uh, that may be uh, right for consideration to be included in the MOU. And some of those uh, um, um, uh, uh, topics that we'll discuss in 20, uh, at upcoming consultation include uh, a uh, including a primary goal and a commitment upholding the open space purposes as, as described in the city charter. Communicating it is the desire of the city and the tribes to let no more than four years lapse between formal consultations. Encouraging the city and the tribes to work together to provide accurate educational information about the history of tribes and other indigenous peoples in Boulder and Jefferson counties. Encouraging the tribes to provide ongoing guidance on cultural resources and education and interpretation of cultural resources. And this may include to develop a framework to identify significant landscape features that are important to the tribes, and then a framework for how the tribes will be notified of proposed projects and activities related to those identified significant areas. A possible new item in the MOU could be providing an opportunity for tribes to routinely meet with the members of the Open Space Board of Trustees. We heard that at the last consultation that they would love the opportunity to meet with this board uh, routinely. And, uh, and so uh, we uh, are thinking of actually putting a clause in the MOU that states that intention. And finally, including in, the, uh, in a revised MOU revisions to update sections uh, where current legislation, current rules and ordinances uh, uh, may apply. So basically, uh, uh, portions of it. For example, the state's unmarked, unmarked burial process has some new guidance that we ought to reflect in a more current MOU. So uh, the third subject likely to be discussed at consultation at the, is the city's desire to develop a land acknowledgement. And some of you may have been tracking this over the past two months or so. Uh, it's been an emerging issue. But in a, in a moment, I'm gonna uh, ask Phil Yates to join us to describe this project. But to wrap up the consultation part of, of this verbal overview, I just wanna alert you and to encourage you to listen in on the April 6th city council meeting. And that's when Ernest House, he's the former executive director of the Colorado Commission of Indian Affairs. He's now a senior policy advisor uh, for the Keystone Policy Center. And he's gonna be providing council with an overview and background for what consultation is, and what to expect in a consultation and the format and the feel for these formal government to, to government negotiations and meetings. So if you haven't had an opportunity to listen in on Ernest, or if you have, it's, a, it's probably been a couple of years now. So April 6th under matters from the city manager, Ernest will be providing about a 45 minute overview for the council. So I encourage you to listen in if that's uh, possible uh, to do. And also in the coming week or so, I, I alluded to this, city staff is going to get together to seek to confirm a consultation date um, and a final agenda and the participants and some of the nitty gritty. And when these de details are forthcoming, uh, we will be sure to update the board. Uh, we know we have a quick turnaround. Uh, it really was a consensus from the tribal representatives on the late February call to have this as soon as possible because their season really starts ramping up in mid, starting in mid-April, and it would be problematic for them to dedicate the time needed past that. So we're in a little bit of a condensed stage. So as we start to hear details and confirmations, we will be sure to relay them to you probably via email. So with that, um, I will now turn it over to Phil, who will provide you with a few minutes of an overview of land acknowledgement. And then that after that, we can open it up for, for questions. Sounds good. Thank you, Dan. Uh, can everyone hear me? Just making sure. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. 
So yeah, um, just would like to provide a little update and information about the city's uh, effort to develop land acknowledgement with the community and American uh, Indian tribes. This information has been shared with the public through several uh, so several avenues, and uh, this is a citywide effort that includes um, housing and human services, open space and mountain parks, the city manager's office, and uh, it's a citywide effort. People can learn more at Be Heard Boulder and to share their comments moving forward. Um, and so as we look forward, what is the city seeking to do with land acknowledgements? Give me one moment. Is, could be, um, looking back at what the Indigenous People's Day resolution says, sorry, is to forge a path forward to address the past uh, is what we're really looking to do as intended in the city's Indigenous People's Day resolution and really recognize important acknowledgements that are in the Indigenous People's Day resolution. Um, we believe this is an important step particularly in the wake of uh, the city passing its recent racial equity plan. Really other really, really important thing is respecting and honoring the relationships the city of Boulder has with American tribes. Uh, we would also like to recognize and respect indigenous people um, as the traditional stewards of the land. And I think an important thing that we all heard, or some of many of us heard during consultation is acknowledge the enduring relationship that continues to exist between indigenous people and their traditional territories. As a part of this, we also want to celebrate their culture, heritage and wisdom, but we also want to inspire and demonstrate ongoing action, which is really important. And another part that we that I think is important to community members, particularly folks that helped develop the Indigenous Peoples Day resolution is counter the doctrine of discovery. And that's just broadly the spiritual, political and legal justification of colonization and seizure of indigenous land. Um, but right now we are in the midst of seeking public from the community and just broadly we're looking to build on the indigenous people's day resolution and city staff plans to use resolutions um, statements in our proposed city government land acknowledgements community members can share their input on these um, on city land acknowledgements through be heard boulder until midnight tuesday march 23rd again what we're really looking at right now is to respect the hard work community members did to develop the indigenous people's day resolution and what we're seeking right now are themes not in the resolution that can be considered for land acknowledgements and as we move forward we're going to be seeking tribal representatives guidance on acknowledgement statements and how the city can use them, uh, including at meetings and web pages with honor and respect. And that's a key aspect of this effort. And I think uh, one thing for us just to take a step is probably to review some key statements that are included in the Indigenous Peoples Day Resolution. So I'd just like to take a moment for everyone to read this real quick. I'll give it a few extra seconds. And if we need to go back, let me know, but I'll move forward if that's okay. So one thing I think it's really important for us to stress is that these could take time. And to what um, <clears throat> Dan was saying, it's really important to remember that tribal representatives consult with many different agencies across the country Dates and plans are tentative right now, it can take time. And one thing that's also important to remember is that this work could span two consultations, so not just one. So we wanna be cognizant that we are working in respect with respect and collaboration as we move forward and we're seeking guidance moving forward. So what we intend right now is that, um, <clears throat> well, we did take an initial first step with uh, receiving HRC feedback. Now we're presenting this update to trustees we are seeking public input through March 23rd. There will be a council update on April 6th. We anticipate tribal consultation happening in early April. Um, as a part of this, we want to ensure that we reach out to tribal governments, particularly to make sure that they can weigh in if we are missed the mark. And then we'll return with a council update somewhere in the summer or fall. So that's it. Um, Dan, do you want to take it over again? Or I think we're open to questions now. I think that's where we're at. And uh, again, I, you know, the purpose of the verbal updates was 
you, there's a lot of details in the packet. You know, um, but if you have any questions on what we covered either verbally in, in the presentation or anything that's in the memo, uh, you know, uh, I'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Uh, Dave. Uh, Phil, there you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for you on the screen. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I have a, a question. Yes, sir. You know, are, are there some examples of, oh, you yeah. know, kind of contexts or, you know, ways that uh, are being envisioned, um, you know, to utilize uh, the acknowledgments? Yeah. So um, just very preliminary as we think about this is kind of what we're thinking is a short statement for consistency that's short and we can build on. And then um, what we're also anticipating is a longer statement that can live on the web page. So we tell a, a broader and fuller um, overview. And so right now is that's kind of where we're at and looking at it right now. But as we move forward, there could be different ways that we could do this where there have been some ideas floated where maybe there's a slide that people could reflect on questions or, um, yeah. So I think right now what we're looking at, there's several uh we have several examples we've looked at the city of denver city of denver has one uh university of colorado has one um, but i think what's really unique and, and kind of very powerful for what we can do here is that we're actually going to be seeking input from tribal nations on um, particularly at how they see it could be used with respect and honor so it could certainly happen at a meeting or on web pages email signatures so what we would like to do is present a series of options of what it looks like what it could look like um, and have them provide feedback. One thing that's important for us to, as we go through, it's really done with honor and respect, and it's not looking like this is just what the city wants to do, and that's what we're gonna do. So we were very intended on being open and to uh, having the opportunity for collaboration and what that looks like. Are we doing some preliminary thinking about the possible uh, interpretive signing on the open space system that would include uh, some of that kind of information. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, an important step as we move further on in consultations moving forward. That, um, as we reflect on what happened during the consultation, I think education and commemoration on the land is an important topic. And as we move forward on that, that is probably something I think could be potential topics uh, at future consultations, but it definitely is a key priority as we think about how we commemorate it and provide education on the land. Great. Dave, if I could just follow up with that, just uh, so in the in the new draft MOU that uh, some tribal representatives and city staff representatives put together to sort of seed a conversation for the next consultation, uh, there's a little bit more robust language about wanting to get more uh, tribal expertise at the table for mm -hmm. educational type of uh, <clears throat> include signage. But we're going to have a couple of specific projects coming up, I think that are going to get our feet wet in that. One is the Fort Chambers poor farm property, which I would, I would expect uh, signage or commemoration of some sort is probably most likely going to come up. And then also the name change at Settlers Park yep. is that will need to be signed. And then going beyond one sign, there's a lot of interpretation already going on out there. And how much of that we ought to look at to either be replaced or modified or and so we're going to be relying on tribal input for those specific projects we already know about. Mm -hmm. Great. And could, uh, is there a possibility that you can uh, get to the board that uh, some of that uh, draft uh, revised language before the, uh, the meetings so that we could have kind of a sense of uh, kind of what you've been working on? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it'll be, uh, part of a full packet, I'd imagine, that we would put out. Um, so absolutely, Dave. Great, thanks. Aaron, and then Hal. I really want to thank Dan and Phil for, for following through on this. Tom and I represented the board at the last consultation in 2019. And um, I think it's really important for you to do as you have done to keep moving the work forward. Um, at the last, uh, um, what is it called? Uh, 
the October uh, Indigenous Peoples Day mm -hmm. in 2019. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with the Audubon Society and a CSU Native faculty member um, to, to create a field trip that was hosted in conjunction with Indigenous Peoples Day. And we had um, all, we offered two separate sessions and all the slots were filled in both of the field trips. The reason why I mention it is I found that the field trip and the, um, what the, the uh, representative from a native tribe from CSU said as she led that field trip to be an excellent way both to get outside of the room where the Indigenous sure. Peoples Day activities were going on, onto open space land, and to hear from her what the land means to her people mm -hmm. and, um, and to Native peoples in general. And I thought it conveyed the kind of cultural and spiritual importance of land, the lands here uh, that are now in open space management um, very well as Phil referred to. And when I think about and read the, the um, efforts on these acknowledgement statements, I think the History Colorado version and the Colorado State University version were very much in keeping with what I learned um, from the uh, native leader on the field trip mm. about the cultural and spiritual importance of the land. And the other thing about the History Colorado and CSU versions that I think are really critical is um, that, that we're partners and that we consult with and work with them in doing the following things in our open space system. And I think that kind of wording is really a significant part of the acknowledgement that, that uh, I'll be looking for. But before I end, I just wanted to ask if it might be possible for Christian or um, another staff member, maybe it's Phil, maybe it's Christian, to set up that kind of field trip for the, the next Indigenous Peoples Day celebration so that we can continue to have an open space element of that celebration okay. with, with a native perspective on the land, because I think it's really important both for the idea of the Indigenous Peoples Day, for the people of Boulder, and for our working relationship with the tribes. That's a thank you for sharing that. And that's definitely an idea we can share with Clay Fong, who helps to put on the Indigenous Peoples Day celebration events. And that's definitely something that we want to echo and uh, share with him. Absolutely. And Dan and Clay were very supportive of the arranging and, and providing the resources for that last field trip. And Great. so they both know what we did and how we did it. Great. And Great. I have I have the documents that we drafted in the process of organizing and, and uh, producing it. So if you need any of those. Yeah, could you share that with me if possible? Sure. That'd be great. Hal. Um, yeah, my question has two parts. I think the first might be for Dan and maybe the second more for Christian. Um, Dan, I, in reading the original memoranda, are all of them signed by the 13 tribes each, or has there been an evolution to the groups who have been official signatories? Is that so? I will attempt to answer it, and Christian and Phil, you could correct me. I believe that the signatories have remained consistent, but as part of, I don't know if we're gonna have time at this consultation, but certainly how, we actually had more than just the signatories participate at the last consultation. I believe two or three other tribal nations joined us for that consultation. So we're expecting that if more than the original 13 join us at future consultation, that they'll also wanna be signatories to new, the new agreement. So um, how to, I believe we have a very short clause in, in the new draft about how 
a new a, a new tribe would come to the table and and be able to participate and sign on to an agreement. So we fully anticipate. I wouldn't call it an issue, but uh, we fully anticipate that the need to address that and the MOU is going to address it very briefly on how it's done. But I would expect the next agreement that we could be we could have up to 16 tribes that actually sign on to that. I don't know, Christian, if you have anything to add. Yeah, as, as a little bit of added context, um, when we have reached out to tribal nations uh, to ask for them to participate in consultations with the city, one thing that we always make sure to do is, is to ask if there are any other tribal nations that previous representatives or previous signatories uh, feel should be in, included in, in the conversations. And, and like Dan said, we have had the addition of, of several tribes since we started asking that question. Great, and then the, the other questions related, Christian, um, you know, as we work on some of these, uh, let's just call them higher level goals, um, we have some specific resources, uh, whether they be, uh, you know, artifacts, et cetera. What is, how are we deter, do we have a system or way of determining giving a basically special voice on certain OSMP projects to those tribes which have unique nexus to that resource? Does that, does that question make any sense? <laughs> yes, yes, I think I, I think I get your meaning. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that we necessarily have an established procedure or way of determining that. Um, and that's, I, I think, partly due to the fact that a lot of the cultural resources that we have at this particular moment, based on the knowledge that we have from previous recordings or, or previous work done with those resources, is to my knowledge at this point, we don't have anything that can be tied to a particular tribe at this <laughs> moment. And that's why ongoing relationship building and, and, and future conversations are so important because frankly, we just do not have that expertise at the city right now. You know, we're, we're talking about cultural resources, artifacts, what have you, that to our, our minds through, through our, I suppose, societal lens, you know, don't have much, that can't be attributed. Whereas, you know, if we build these relationships with tribal nations, talk to the people that have the knowledge, you know, bring them out to cultural resources, that that sort of information could kind of come through those interactions. But it is, it is certainly not something that I would claim that I'm able to do right now, just based on the information that I have. Now, just so a, a, little, a little follow up to that. So one of the original agreements was focused on Jewel Mountain, knowing that, that that's a site of importance to tribes. And so there's actually stipulations in that, that if we were, before we commence on any activities such as trail building or any, any, I mean, we don't do development, but any type of disturbing elements out there, that that agreement specifically recognizes that that's probably an, an important uh, uh, piece of land for tribal interests and that we ought to provide them an opportunity uh, to know about any upcoming projects like that. And so th that's a specific property that we, that has a specific sort of agreement around. Belmont Butte, we went through a number of discussions over a period of about a decade with them, knowing that that was a significant property for them. And uh, of course, it's, it's a site that's got a lot of issues to it. So working with them on that particular site. The, uh, uh, we daylighted to you through the big lifts conversation uh, earlier in February about you know, a need to do uh, certain uh, planning efforts. And one is, is to develop a cultural resource management plan. It's something we haven't had. And that's Christian's going to be the, uh, the lead uh, 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 project manager for that, for that site, for that project. There could be elements of the uh, cultural resources management plan that begins to maybe formalize what that process would be to uh, how to provide more information to tribes and to get that exchange of information on, on sites that may be important to them, features that may be important to them. And we're looking for the cultural resources management plan as a, a potential um, tool or, or document that could 
provide some more meat to that question, Hal, and, and to more specificity to it. Thank you. And though uh, the department is still doing uh, or requesting uh, tribal assistance for certain site reviews, aren't we? It, right now, te technically the way that the agreements are written right now, the only one that we would be specifically requesting for would be Jewel Mountain. There have been site, there have been reviews that were conducted in the past, um, but that is, that's not something that we are currently doing because we did not have those established relationships with uh, tribal nations. The other aspect of this was that the early, the earlier agreements, um, the tribes came together in the United Tribes of Colorado and, and that group designated a specific tribal monitor. However, the United Tribes of Colorado as a organization, institution, whatever you wanna call it, is now defunct. So essentially what we are dealing with right now are is each tribe on an individual basis. And so from the perspective of having those, those types of reviews, um, you know, like if, if we were to be asking that, like let's say we did do something at Jewel Mountain, we would be reaching out to each individual tribe individually to hear their perspectives. I, I think that, you know, we're hoping that the MOU can create a framework kind of like the old framework, whereas, there was agreement on who, who was the person that the tribes might agree on that would be qualified to offer that type of a service to the city. But I think, yeah, if anything happened at Jewel Mountain, we would just have to reach out individually and, and go from there. Yeah, the earlier arrangement is what I'm remembering as far as the mm -hmm. de designation of a tribal monitor for you know, you know, specific projects or reviews and. I, I think uh, getting back to the cultural resources management plan effort, it, that be well worth, you know, getting that done and kind of resurrecting some, you know, uh, element that uh, that can enable us to do that. Exactly, and that's and that's something that you know even the tribes voiced at the 2019 consultation that they that many representatives did voice that they did want to be involved at that level again. Great. Other questions or comments for? <laughs> yeah, for we got a couple of real quick questions just on the memo language uh, or yeah, questions. You know, uh, I don't know who I should address this to, Phil or. or Probably Phil. me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll but take on, that one. On page five, uh, right under uh, the paragraph under the land acknowledgement guidance uh, heading, it says it refers to a U.S. Department of Culture. Yes. And I have never heard of that. Is, yeah. What is that? It's a grassroots. I think I had put it in that. It, they specifically call themselves a grassroots organization. Should not be, as far as I know, um, with a U.S. government agency. But it is a group that is uh, has put out great guidance on land acknowledgments. Yeah. And um, but as far as I know, they're a grassroots organization that that is uh, <clears throat> looks to to communicate about the importance of this. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's it's uh, a grassroots organization to the best of my knowledge. But they have provided great guidance on land acknowledgments. Well, I saw the explanation. <laughs> Um, but the uh, the title uh, yeah. uh, is perplexing because it's not an official government entity. Is that correct? As far as I know, uh, but I, I do want to support that they provided great guidance. Yeah, I think your interpretation is right, but also respect that uh, they provided good guidance. Yep. Yeah, we might uh, we might in in addition to the explanation want to put a non governmental. Right. Uh, grassroots, you know, in, in front of that so that uh, it's pretty clear on what, yes, sir. what, what they are. <laughs> and then down at the last line on that page, um, in the last bullet, it says opening up spaces with reverence and respect. And I'm just wondering uh, what is exactly meant. Right. That? I think a lot is uh, creating an opportunity for people to reflect that it's not performative. Um, 
and that we do honor the the history and the the deep relationship that indigenous people have with the land and so it's it's coming from a place of of respect and and honor and and i think too is like putting people in a place for us to reflect on the past and think about moving forward um i don't want to over interpret their their guidance but maybe that could be different for other people but um it's always important i think to remember something like that Dave, are, are you trying to refer whether or not we're talking about physical spaces or whether or, we're yeah. Yeah, the allowing words, for like the mental head space? It's more mental yeah. health space, I yeah. think, yeah. Yeah, so the word spaces, I think, is the kind of the anomaly oh. there. And so can can we kind of uh, be more specific or a little clearer on what exactly that refers to? Can you just uh, read it again? I just don't have the memo right in front of me. Yeah. Uh, I, I got it, Phil, but um, it just said uh, the bullet just says take a cue from indigenous protocols, opening up spaces with reverence and respect. And so my question yeah. is, what does spaces actually mean? I think that's to Dan's point, it's that mental kind of space that we have together and we communicate together i'm not thinking it's the way i interpret it and i think it's i'll leave it open to interpretation from other folks is that way that we speak with each other in that context and space yeah, so that we can work together phil i guess the question would be is is this taken verbatim from the department of cultures it's thing? taken verbatim and i i yeah i mean there probably could have been a quote around it it was taken verbatim okay well we might want to you know add a brief clarification or some, or explanation or something so that I, I think people can kind of get a better sense of what actually that means. That's fine. Yeah, okay. no, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And Phil, I noticed that they refer to themselves as the US Department of Arts and Culture. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was make, good. <laughs> to make some updates. But no, um, no, this is, uh, I think, over the course of a period of time is was collecting best practices and guidance from a multitude of organizations. And this mm -hmm. is one that has been shared frequently among staff and among several folks that's well respected and uh, one that I think we want to take to heart. Yeah. Uh, anything else, Dave? No, that was it. Thanks. Okay, you bet. Anyone else uh, on this topic? Okay, then we'll kick it back to you, Dan. I really appreciate that conversation. It, it, it's really an honor to work in this space. Um, I think Christian and will attest that um, when I first, this is my first experience working with, uh, you know, uh, American Indian nations and, and indigenous peoples uh, in this type of context. And I never, you know, thought I'd have this opportunity. So it's, it's, it's great to be able to have this discussion mm -hmm. The board and we look forward to uh upcoming consultation and keeping you guys informed and involved so dan the at the last in-person consultation only um one member of the open space board of trustees was allowed at a time i'm gathering from what you've said that for the zoom consultation all of us might be able to be part of that is that correct mm -hmm. I purposely did not state any specific because that we haven't had a chance to group and get our consultant involved in saying what we do know is that from the tribal perspective is that these negotiations are typically closed door because they're negotiations between governments. So right. we're going to have to, uh, this virtual space is due to us. So I think that's the topics that we're going to have to address later this week and get Ernest House involved to kind of figure out exactly what the setup is going to be, what's the participant level like. And th that's one of the areas where we know we have to get back to you on. I, I just want to second what you said about how, um, I, what a new experience and how inspirational the last consultation was to me and the, the opportunity to be involved in it. So I would encourage board members to the degree that we can to participate <clears throat> in that because I think yeah. it, I think it's a really useful uh, thing to make time for. Yep. And uh, if it turns out that um, what that role is and, and how it gets defined, I'll probably reach out and work with Hal and trying to coordinate what that may look like from a, from a board perspective. So, <clears throat> or Kirk, depend on what time <laughs> we're talking, right? April 1st or March 31st. 
<laughs> okay, um, just uh, a, a couple of verbal announcements uh, before we uh, get into the uh, heart of the uh, uh, tonight's discussion is uh, I just want to do uh, alert you to a, a couple of opportunities. Um, there's the, uh, what we typically would call the new board member orientation. Um, we know that the city, uh, a group of city staff have gotten together to do sort of a, a fresh look at orientation and they're adding se several more, several new elements to the orientation. And so while, you know, historically it's been a new member orientation, uh, an invite I think is going to go out to all, all any and all trustees, including mm -hmm. whether you're the new freshman on the block. Uh, so mm -hmm. let you know that on March 30th, from 6 to 9 p.m. I think that might be a Tuesday, Tuesday night. Um, uh, but March 30th is the first opportunity, the same meeting, but a second opportunity is gonna be on a Saturday on April 10th. So uh, I will make sure uh, that you all get an invite for that. And of course the new trustee will hopefully be able to join one of those two meetings. I also wanted to alert you all, and I already gave Hal a, uh, a heads up, um, but uh, they're gonna add a, a second uh, type of orientation and that's gonna be specifically for board chairs. Um, mm. Just recognizing that sometimes a board chair comes on and they've never had experience with running a meeting or uh, facilitating a meeting and that it would be super helpful. What we heard mm. feedback wise is super helpful to have a specific orientation for chairs. So we're anticipating that will be later in the spring. We don't have a date for that yet, but as soon as I hear it, I'll make sure I pass that on to you. <clears throat> and I just wanted to also just alert you, uh, you know, staff changes when you have an organization this large is, is pretty much a, a constant thing, but occasionally there, there happens to be a, 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 a a retirement that sort of deserves special recognition. And I just want to let you know that a few weeks ago, Lori Dieter uh, from our vegetation management uh, program retired after 30 years of service wow. uh, with open space and Palm parks. And, wow. and so we had a little goodbye celebration for, uh, for Lori, but I just thought the board would want to know some of you may have worked with Lori over the years. And of course she, her latest work is, is the tall oak grass uh, 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 project um, uh, in the back of the Shanahan Ridge that was a very passionate project for her and I think put that put that issue on the map for a lot of people and a lot of citizens. So just wanted to uh, let you know about uh, Lori's uh, retirement uh, from the system. And in April, I expect to be able to announce another retirement, but I will hold off on that one because, hey, it's always good to have fresh news at a board meeting. <laughs> So with that, uh, Kurt, I think mm -hmm. we'll turn it over to you to move us into the <clears throat> section. Yeah, uh, so as we discussed, uh, Alan, you and I, uh, we moved all of the topics related to CU South Atlantic Station together under Madison, the board, largely because they derived from the study session that the board had on those issues. Um, so mm -hmm. this is a place for for that discussion, but let me ask you first, um, Dan, is there new information on the timeline that you want well, to update us on as a context? Yeah, I mean, you know, before before the study session, I just alerted you that we, we did set up a, a, a brief time for Phil Kleisler, a senior planner for the city of Boulder to, to present you all with the 2021 timeframe for certain milestones. And so I asked Phil if we could just, uh, carry on with that just to make sure we have a you know the same level of knowledge amongst the trustees about what's what's coming down the pike I did not go into this level mm -hmm. of detail when I presented you verbally some of the highlights I think I focus mainly on open space mountain parks so uh, uh, Phil's going to join us or has joined us here and give you a few minutes of overview of the calendar as we know it now and realizing that it's fluid and that if you have any specific questions about the milestones and the touches that we foresee things right now in 2021, this will be the opportunity uh, uh, to ask Phil 
And then I think Phil uh, is planning to stick around during board's discussion, uh, next discussion. And if you have any questions that may be, uh, uh, shed some light on too. So he'll join us Great. on the remainder of the night. So Phil, thank you for ruining another one of your nights uh, with us. <laughs> I wouldn't mean the world. Yeah. Um, if you'd like, if it's if it's okay with, with the board, I could um, share my screen and maybe just yeah. go through some of the dates talking about Please. um so phil kleisler um i worked as a planner in the planning and development services department and really appreciate um you letting me visit with you tonight and you can see that slide okay that yes okay perfect okay um I, I i talked the other day for a few minutes before someone let me know that they couldn't see anything so um it's always good to check um i have just a few things I kind of a high level and then a more tactical view of what to expect in the coming months. And so, you know, this board is well aware that there are two um, kind of two projects as part of this kind of super project that are both dependent on one another happening concurrently and have, have different um, timelines. And so that's the, that would be the flood mitigation project, My, major milestones shown here on the uh, in black slide currently and, and Brandon Coleman is on the call tonight as well in case you have any questions for him, but his team uh, of city staff and consultants are working through the preliminary design um, uh, through this year. Um, and then concurrently, we are working on the CU South annexation. So the application was actually submitted in early 2019. And so um, we are working on uh, the terms now um, and we'll get into some more dates in just a second, but we would anticipate a vote um, by council later this year um, in the fall. Um, and then following that annexation decision, um, depending on what that is, um, we would see design permitting and ultimately construction by 2026 of the flood mitigation project. I think you've probably seen this diagram before. Um, the I would say the top and the bottom rows are a pretty standard process in our development review um, process um, for annexations. Um, but really leading into that submittal, uh, the university's application being submitted, council held a study session and recognized that this particular project, there were a lot of complexities, a lot of moving parts, and as such, they wanted to make sure there was ample time um, for not only community input, but also, and very much emphasized by council board input. And so these discussions we see as really valuable and helpful um, in this process. Uh, and so after going back and forth a few times on the written comments, that's the top row. Um, and that was memorial to the term sheet, which, um, which you're, you discussed at your study session a couple of weeks ago. Um, we um, went through the process to select a flood mitigation option last summer. And following that, we worked with our process committee, who's comprised of two council members um, who hold a public meeting each month. Um, and we went and developed a um, community engagement plan. We developed a, the briefing book that you all talked about last month, or I believe that was last month now, um, and brought all that information to the planning board and council for discussion last year. And we're kind of now in the middle of this community engagement process where we're hearing about some of the um, interest and concerns and, and trying to really get an understanding about where the community is and some of these key issues. And then we'll be presenting that this is a little bit out of date. I just pulled up an old presentation with council in April. Um, and depending on that direction, we would negotiate the remaining terms of the agreement and release a draft annexation agreement um, to the community ahead of time. Um, and there would be a period where, where folks could comment and we would go into the more traditional and um, standard uh, planning board public hearing with a recommendation to council. Um, to look at a more tactical level, this is just a kind of a running list of the different key dates that we share with our process committee every month. And so the grayed out um, dates are just ones that have already taken place. We've had a lot of really interesting, you know, neighborhood meetings, meetings with groups such as Fraser Meadows, Safe South Boulder, a great meeting um, just about a week or so ago with the South Creek 7 neighborhood. Um, and now we're here with, with you uh, this evening on March 10th. Um, do we, we are anticipating, uh, we had to move our monthly process committee meeting from um, March uh, 19th to the 18th 
of this month. Um, and the process committee, for those unaware, is uh, was created a, a year, a year and a half ago, and it's comprised of two council members that really guide staff on on what what is the process. So it stays out of content as best if we can, um, and really looks at the public process and the sequencing of boards and council discussions and so on. Uh, we are looking at um, um, scheduling in a community briefing in early April. Once some of the materials and, and we're able to, to kind of have pen to paper and have materials and memos written for the Transportation Advisory Board in April, the Planning Board um, on April 15th, and then finally City Council. The City Council meeting is really this, um, this, this bubble here in that flow chart where um, we're going to be bringing the themes from this engagement, what we're hearing from the community, what we're hearing from boards, and, and um, basically get a temperature check to make sure that we're heading in the right direction. And if we're stuck, if we're in disagreement with the university on anything, we'll be flagging those for some council direction on, on how to handle those. Um, we have several other dates and um, to not go too far into the details here, I would wanna just really flag a, a few of these. And this would be, um, right now we're penciling in June 17th as a public hearing before the planning board. This would be um, the formal process where they would um, hold a public hearing and provide a recommendation of a, approval or denial to city council. City council would have this generally on their first, on their consent agenda on July 20th for a first reading. Um, and then in late August, possibly a second, um, a special meeting for the city council second reading. And that might also be you know, divided into two meetings given the interest in the community and what we would likely see in public comment, the length of public comment. And so um, that's pretty far out there. And so I would say the, the planning board council um, uh, meetings um, in the summer, late summer and fall are, are tentative um, and, and they are penciled in just for the purpose of having it scheduled. So the agenda doesn't get too um, filled up. Great, Does thank that, you, uh, Phil. Uh, and you know, I'll say as I ask the question, it certainly what you've made clear is that the board's input to the annexation discussions is very timely. So I appreciate the board members who pushed for a study session uh, in late February. I think uh, this is good timing. So questions for uh, Phil, I see Hal's hand. Yeah, hey, Phil, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, Dave and I have been uh, sort of assigned to do some thinking about the timeline, and um, I'm sure Dave has some, some other comments to make too, but one thing we agreed on that we were a little confused about um, is given that the uh, flood project is the life and safety project, which was the original impetus for opening this door, um, it's interesting that we have such an aggressive timeline on annexation and what appears to be a somewhat casual timeline on the life and safety issues. Can you help us understand what that decision making is about? Well, I, you know, I would invite Brandon to, to weigh in on the timeline for flood mitigation. The sense I get is that it's not, it's not casual, that the team is moving pretty quickly on that. Um, and with the annexation, um, you know, we, we've had it in the, in the queue now for two years. Um, and, and so we're just kind of working through the process. When I said it's tentative later in the year for planning board and council, um, we have to, we wanted to have something there so that folks could uh, um, plan for what, what, what this pro project looks like. And so those, those are definitely could change. But Brandon, I see you're on too and muted. And so, Brandon, um, it might be helpful under the, the um, microphone, if you click the arrow, you can select your headphones. And I'll just, Leah and Allison, I don't know if I mentioned that Brandy may be on, so perhaps he's not, maybe <laughs> hey. you might have to physically un unmute him. Let me check. I <laughs> thought he was a co, but... I thought he was a co-host. Nope, here. Keep talking, Brandon, you're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 
Sometimes sometimes it's better if I just stay muted the whole time. (laughs) So yes, Uh, thanks thanks to the board for letting me be here. I just wanted to kind of, you know, the annexation and the flood are uh, pretty closely tied, as you mentioned, Hal. So it's just wanted to be available to answer questions as well. And I think um, as the board's aware, uh, we've been working on the flood design probably as quickly as we can. And as Phil mentioned, uh, we, we just got through our conceptual design analysis. And just recently in February, we kind of got the approval with a flood design to move ahead without other alternatives on the table. So we have been doing some of the preliminary work for the flood design that we're working on now, but now we're really starting uh, into the design in mm-hmm. earnest. And that's that's where a lot of those milestones come from for the flood mitigation design. They're based on the design activities with each of uh, those components. I, I guess I, I regret my use of the word casual. That was a <laughs> poorly chosen word. I know that people are working very hard on this. Um, my point is, is that the, the annexation is very complex. And later this evening, we'll be discussing some of uh, this board's interests in the annexation. And I just hope that people understand the timeline as presented sets up a a potential situation where there is annexation and no no immediate path to flood mitigation. And so I just think people should think about that and sit with that and ponder Mm -hmm. that closely. And just let me uh, add to what Hal said, uh, Brandon and Phil, you know, I think the board's concern is that we really, we probably uh, as much as any other city entity can't divorce those two projects. Um, In our minds, they're, you know, they're intimately related. And so the timing um, of one or the other certainly affects, you know, the concerns that we have. And and I think some of the commitments uh, that we are either hopeful, anticipating, or expecting uh, as part of, of those decisions, um, you know, can sometimes get uh, awry. And I think it's a big concern for us that uh, we be as clear as we can as a city on what it is that we need when it is that we need it and who it is that's going to provide it. Um, Other thoughts or questions, uh, particularly on the timeline for either Phil or Brandon, and we we really do appreciate you both being here tonight. Uh, Karen. Let me just underscore what Hal and Dave have said. Um, and maybe say it in a little bit of a different way. Um, Because I'd really like to hear from Phil and Brandon why our concerns should not be great grave concerns. The reason why I think Hal and Dave have brought up a really important issue is because based on the the schedule that, that Phil has just reviewed, it appears that the city council will have made decisions on the annexation by late August. And yet OSBT has been told that, well, don't worry about really overthinking the flood control issue because it'll be the fall before we come back to you with a 30% design. So it seems to me that those two schedules are really out of sync. And I would agree with what Dave said that to us, those two decisions are really intertwined and to have one come months before the other even gears up to the point that you wanna hear from us at the 30% design period is out of sync as I see it. And Karen, I would just add um, that I think your desire and other board members' desires to have the study session was an effort to deal with the fact that they seemed out of sync to make sure that we were not waiting for the 30% design to give our thoughts on the annexation and how they might be connected. Yeah, and I think that's the reason as we, 
as we move into kind of the, the next conversation on, on, you know, articulating some of our specific concerns on annexation, that we thought that, that we should do that as soon as possible so that, you know, it, it's pretty clear on kind of where the board as uh, entities uh, stands on, um, on some of those issues. I, I just want to uh, clarify too that our original timing, uh, I think Hal, you were reading my face when you guys were talking about a study session in two weeks from now. And the reason being is we had we had what you all did at the study session and tonight, we had that penciled in for April. So it wasn't like we were going to skip the board. We just, we were just going to do a, a the city staff was going to take April on full tilt and go to a couple of different boards, including this one. So in hindsight, I think you did city staff a favor in which we, you, you divvied up, you, you divvied up some of that work, but uh, we were, we, we were, we did pencil in uh, March to go over this and then April to do the annexation. So uh, the board uh, obviously crafted out a, a, a little bit of a different path, which in hindsight, I think is working out great. So. I, I guess I might be able to help answer Karen's question a little bit, I guess. Um, so the board's concerns, I think uh, the board has articulated a lot of concerns with the flood mitigation project, and we've taken uh, those with our design criteria. Uh, groundwater is a really good example. So we're doing a pretty robust groundwater model right now uh, in response to the board's concerns. We also, uh, if just recently, uh, when the when the project moved on to open space property and there was a request for the upstream analysis, uh, we did work on that uh, most recently. So I would say the boards uh, passed numerous motions and I think they've passed them at good times and we've, we have been incorporating that into the design criteria and um, the schedule tries to reflect when the design is at a level that we'll be able to answer uh, questions uh, related to those existing motions. Yeah. I appreciate that, Brandon. I think to clarify, and I, I imagine I can speak for most, our critique isn't that that your part of the project isn't moving fast enough. It's more of concerns about uh, what appears like an acceleration of the annexation side. We understand your project is highly complex with a lot of work to do. Um, it's, it's really the other side of the variable. Sure. Okay, other questions or comments uh, for Phil or Brandon about the timeline? Or Dan, do you have anything else you want to uh, cover as context here before we move into our board's uh, considerations? No. Okay. All right. Well, again, thanks to Phil and Brandon for being here. And uh, you may have more comments for us, or we may have more questions for you as we, as we proceed. Um, Karen, do you want to lead out? I mean, I think your motion is based on a lot of the issues that came up during the study session. And I think what you've tried to do is, uh, is craft something that addresses all of those concerns as uh, our feedback to both staff and to council. Right. Um, my guess is the uh, board members uh, recall that at the end of the study session, we talked about, so what's next? And Kurt and I were tasked with the responsibility to go back and review all the notes and try to put um, all the things that we had discussed at the study session into a, a draft motion. And um, we, as, as I indicated at the end of the study session, oh my gosh, that's next week. And so we did finish our draft uh, this weekend and on Monday, Leah sent it out to everybody and posted it on the website so that the public also could see uh, the draft. Um, the only thing that I wanna mention is at the end of each paragraph, we've added the term sheet numbers that refer to relevant uh, items in the term sheet. Some of them are more directly and some of them are less directly addressing the, the issues, um, but they're in, in one way or another relevant. Um, and it's my hope that we can go through this 
and entertain revisions, suggestions for alternative wording or whatever suggestions you have, having had a couple of days to look at it and work with it yourselves. And I would propose that we do that by sections, Karen. I think we would take the introduction as the first and then the rest of the topics have headers. So those are fairly easy to organize. Caroline, you got a question or a thought. Can I just ask, do all board members have the term sheet available to them right now? It was in the packet that we got for the study session. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that um, everyone has it in front of them. So if oh, someone needs to reference them. it, it's close by. Let's see. I, I, I know I do. Others I saw have Hodge at least it. access to it. Karen, you have your term sheet around? I do. Yeah. And then Dave, do you? Perfect. Yep. So we all do. Thank you, Caroline. It is a foundational document. Okay. Well, Karen, do you want to entertain uh, comments or proposed amendments to your why introduction? Don't, why don't you go ahead and chair us through this, uh, Kurt, as you're doing? That'd be great. Okay. Uh, well, I think everyone then has a copy of uh, the motion that Karen and I put together. Um, I'm hoping you do, and the public too uh, can get it off of our meeting website if they haven't already. <clears throat> this is a pretty lengthy motion, uh, but there were a lot of issues to cover. And so the first uh, two paragraphs uh, really are just trying to describe what this is about, why we're doing it, and who it's for. Does anyone have, and I'm not going to get into reading things uh, unless there are changes. And then, of course, once we've made all the changes, we will then entertain a full motion, reading the whole motion and putting it on the table. But uh, I see Hal's hand to start with. Hal. Yeah, the question is whether we want to have the document up on the uh, shared screen. I don't know whether that helps or not. I think it's a challenge then is that I can't see. I'm happy to share it, Kurt, if that's helpful. I know it's harder. You have to choose if you want the document or people, but I can share it or just type separately, whatever. Is I think what we'll, excuse me, I think what we'll do, Leah, is we will share it when someone has proposed wording changes. And that might start right now with Hal. So okay. Hal, go ahead. Um, it's, it's not so much a wording change before we even talk about the introduction. Given that the motion is divided into, I think it's six different parts. I'm wondering, do we want to establish a title for this motion? Um, I mean, a big part of how I see it conceptually, this is OSBT considerations of business specifically in the annexation negotiation, which is a different thing than pre-existing uh, flood mitigation motions. Mm -hmm. And basically just wondering if we'd be doing people a favor to add a title. Yeah, it's a good thought. Um, Do you have any specific wording that you want to suggest, Hal? I would, I, 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 I would go with something like OSBT recommendations regarding open space business in the CU South annexation. Business may be the wrong word, but. <clears throat> yeah, these are, I think your wording's very close, Hal. Uh, these are our recommendations to council really, because that's who we provide recommendations to, to council regarding CU South annexation. Um, that's the sure. shortest version. Regarding the terms of the CU South annexation, right? right? Right, yeah. So OSBT recommendations to council regarding the terms of the CU South annexation. Leah, do you have that? <clears throat> okay, good, good catch, Hal, thank you. Uh, any other recommended changes to the introduction? And so Leah, in the final motion, all that, all that stuff at the beginning would go away. Uh, you, I'm sure you understand that. Um, 
Any other changes to the introductory material? Do we want to uh, keep the, the statement that's in brackets just so that people know what the numbers are? Yes, that's a very good point, Karen. I think you should keep that after the title, Leah. The parenthetical, the numbers in brackets refer to, et cetera. Dave, you've got your hand up. Yeah, uh, Kurt, I, I was just going to suggest that, you know, we refer to variant one in several places in the introduction, and it just strikes me that we ought to uh, preface that or associate that with the city's proposed flood mitigation project or something so that <clears throat> it's clear to not only the council but to the public. About it's a good point. Uh, we use did. that as a shorthand. Yeah. So, um, why don't we say the variant one South Boulder Creek flood control project? That, yeah, something like that would be fine. Okay, so Leah, that was describing mitigations for the variant one South Boulder Creek flood control project. And then thereafter, I think we can just refer to it as variant one. <clears throat> Good catch, Dave. Anything else on the introductory material? I had one more thought, Karen, the part, the note in the parentheses, since those don't begin down until the subsections, should we move that down below the introductory paragraph and just before the next sections? I feel like at the top, you're kind of like, what is that in, just positionally? Does that make sense? Sure, or we could put a, an asterisk as, after the brackets the first time they occur and put a footnote that says the numbers in brackets refer to term sheet numbers in the 2020 briefing book that are relevant. Yeah, yeah. I, think it's a, great. I think it's a good idea to move it, Hal. So, um, Leah, can we, do, know, can we take that, um, that, uh, upper part in brackets um, and remove the word the at the beginning and just create a footnote out of it that comes um, after each parentheses series of numbers in the segments below. Yeah, just for the sake of time, I'm making myself a note, but that'll be a part of it when we send it in. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a really good idea. Thank you, Leah, Hal. Leah, another, another question. Uh, organizationally, can we put some space between the paragraphs and the various uh, subheadings so that um, it's, it's more readable? Sure. Yeah, I can indent or space or... Or both. Like, yeah. <laughs> I think we ought to... It's a rather lengthy motion, so we ought to make it as easy and convenient to... Uh, uh, read as possible. Sure. And uh, Dave, where where is it that you're suggesting the space? Well, actually, between each paragraph, and then um, on the subheadings, the first one being the underlying you neo know, land for restoration, so that those are all <laughs> separate, so that people can kind of get <clears throat> some sense of uh, what it is that the topics are. In my PDF, Dave, there is a space there. Oh, okay. my, my yeah. document has spaces too between each paragraph with a underlined subhead. I, I'm gonna I think to, I, I'm going to have to throw my iPad out. <laughs> I, I think I know what you're saying, though, Dave. Um, like one carriage return between all the paragraphs is yeah. normal and customary, right. but perhaps two between the introduction and those uh, uh, the main sections would be getting at Dave's point. Yes, that would be great. Okay. And even indenting the first word in the paragraph, yeah, would be great. You got <laughs> it. We'll do All it. All right, well. thank you. <laughs> Dave, what about the font? The what? The font? What about the font? <laughs> yeah, I uh, my uh, backup is always, uh, you know, Times New Roman 12. Yeah, there you go. Good. <laughs> okay. Well, um, the substantive stuff here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're through the first half of the first page. That's amazing. Then Moving on. A... And you know, um, formatting is important. I don't see any reason to not number 
these, it might be easier for people in the future to refer to the, the subparts of the motions as numbers one through whatever. Um, if that strikes people as a good idea, we should have done that, Karen. <clears throat> okay, well then going to number one, land for restoration to offset impacts of variant one. Uh, does anyone have a suggested amendment to that? I see Caroline. So if everyone has the term sheet around them close, what I'm going to refer to is number eight, which, uh, let me see here. I'm on page eight of the term sheet of the, the hard copy. Right. Um, and the very top of it says key issue number two, identify options for addressing CU stated interest in 30 plus acres of land. Are we all, I'll wait for everyone to have that pulled up. Is there a better way for me to discuss what I'm looking at? Or so uh, I just wanna be clear, Caroline, the number of the key issue that you're directing us to is eight? No, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It is oh. page eight of the term sheet if you have the printout version in front of you or it should be the same if it's on the computer. Um, I confused eight and page eight. Uh, and so what's the number of the key the issue? Number of the key issue, yeah. It should be uh, key issue 11, I think, right? It, it's interesting because on the page, oh, yes, 11. It says determine suitable recreational uses mm -hmm. for the area within the flood mitigation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Okay. Key issue 11. So when I look at option two and read that, I just have um, a lot of concerns with what is going to appear on those 30 acres and how that will impact open space property with its proximity related to groundwater, related to endangered species, related to critical habitat. Um, and it's concerning to me because when you look at um, the responses from CU, um, it appears that a lot of cost would be on the city or on open space in and of itself. And especially today after being able to see, um, you know, what has happened this past year with COVID and our department, it just seems that if the 30 acres um, or 34 acres, whatever we're going to call it for the recreational facilities or we're calling it university um, sports field, turned into something that appears much greater than it's being listed and talked about now that could be extremely problematic for our lands and what we are able to afford. Um, I just feel like, you know, sports field, they require seating capacity. And then along with that comes parking, storage, bathrooms, facilities, locker rooms. And for universities, um, you know, the, the intercollegiate um, sports is important to them, it's important to the students, it's important um, for a lot of schools, that's a big portion of why students choose to go to a school or not. So I feel like the wording is showing it as like, you know, this might be a soccer field or, you know, just kind of like a, a hometown baseball field. But when you look at traditional universities and the revenue that they acquire, a huge majority of it comes from their sports. So it would seem unlikely that that 34 acres would not be used for quite a bit of um, economic growth for the university. So in stating all of that, I was reading our um, open space charter and section 176 E, G and H um, kind of jump out at me a lot because again, if that property 
isn't our land, but is so close to us. And as we consider these annexation agreements um, and what's going to happen with flood mitigation and being able to look forward into the future, um, it's very concerning that its proximity to such highly valuable land is going to possibly create um, a lot of destruction for um, you know, this critical habitat in open space land. So with saying that, I'm going to um, see if perhaps the other board members would be open to using Karen's, I'm gonna pause my talking for a second, um, either integrating it in or um, if everyone liked what I'm about to say, uh, might just become its own point. Um, and I have some wording that I can use now but what I am um, suggesting is that we recommend to city council that at its current state, we would be unable to be in acceptance of such a large um, 34 acres of, again, recreational facilities or university sports field, however it wants to be worded, um, just because we're unable to see what that looks like in the future. Um, and again, knowing that that is just a, a very high revenue stream for traditional universities. Um, so it staying just kind of like a, a grass soccer field is, is not something that I, I think is really um, feasible. Um, so the preliminary wording that I have, if we were to change, well, should I stop here, Kurt, is that? Oh. Well, we can, one thing we could do, Caroline, before you get your specific language is we could, uh, we could ask Phil uh, Kleisler to talk a little bit about what his understanding is about the limits of the, the development of that public area for athletic fields and related that might be illuminating. I, you know, I mean, long ago, there seemed to have been an agreement that there wouldn't be a football stadium there. Uh, what else do you think you can tell us, Phil? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the term sheet, I will be the first one to say, it's like, it's it's kind of weird to get through and hard to get across like what's really on the table. And it's like that because it's a document that evolved over the last two years. And so when you see the that key issue two, when it, and it has some options, that was, um, when we initially responded to the university's application in March of 2019, we identified six key issues. One of them involved finding something to do with um, the university's stated interest of 30 acres for rec fields and the, the cities at the time, the 500 year flotation project. So we inund inundated land that they wanted for that. We also inundated land that they wanted for housing. And so those were two of those big six issues. Um, and so in this, and, and so as we've kind of gone through this, um, I can just, maybe just, if it's okay, I could just share one, one quick diagram, sure. not to take up too much time. Um, yeah. But city staff, you'll see similar to what Brandon had mentioned, um, you know, we're definitely using your previous motions to um, um, implement um, a robust open space program for the open space other area. And in our last set of comments to them, we're really, we're really trying to put them into this park urban other area. So it's hard to see, but there's a gray line here. And so this area here is the open space other, and this is the park urban other. And so what we would prefer is that if there are rec fields that they be placed in, the, in this area um, around um, the flood mitigation project. Um, we also, um, you are correct in that we, um, the, we've talked about not having a football field or stadium or things like that. So the annexation agreement will include specific definitions about what's not allowed. And what we're looking at is um, probably, um, you know, I don't, much less of an intense um, use than um, I think than what you're talking about. It could be something like a POTS field or something like that, but we're looking at What's the limit on the occupancy? What are some of the characteristics? What are the setbacks from any open space property? Um, and also leaving an option there to 
um, have mutually agreeable fencing if we feel that's appropriate. I, I guess the question I have, Kurt, is, uh, and actually Caroline, is the 30 plus acres you're talking about part of the 119 or are you seeing that as separate? Because in my mind, what we're saying is that we want the entire 119 OSO acreage for project mitigation. And so the university had requested you know, 30 or so acres of that for recreational uses. But uh, our, our uh, opinion is that the entire thing should come uh, as open space so that that recreational use is uh, prohibited. That's what staff has been trying to implement, um, Dave. And, and um, yeah, so I think we're on the same page as and, and just for double clarity, Phil, in your um, illustration, the recreational fields that are plotted are on the public, not the OSO. In the park urban other, so it's that area yep. around the flood mitigation. Okay, park um, urban other. And, yep. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, and um, so this is a point of disagreement, though, um, where the university wants to retain the right to use some of the OSO. We feel that um, you know an acre less than 119 really complicates um, any approval of, of an annexation, and so it's something that we feel strongly about. And we're, we've been attempting to implement the board's previous recommendations for through this process. So I think that's great, and Caroline, I do think that what you're suggesting, though, is worth noting uh, for any other recreational field use on that property that there's still potential impacts on open space associated with those potential recreational uses. Yeah. So Caroline, let's go back to you then and have you share your language and so we can figure out where it fits. Mm -hmm. And, and um, just to add really quick, when you continue to read the document, it just, it really concerns me when, um, you know, CU talks about, um, I'm sorry, let me, the print is so small. Yeah. Um, I just had it and then I lost it. They talk about um, what happens during a flood and being able to um, get the water off of their property as quickly as possible. Um, and that, you know, any damage done, um, regarding drainage and detention. So that also really concerns me because, okay, so the city will ensure flood detention area will be engineered to, to sufficiently drain within a reasonable period of time. Um, so if the city is worried that the university um, is going to ask for something, if we have a flood and it is not removed in a timely basis off of their turf fields and therefore um, ruins their grass that that is going to somehow take priority over what would need to happen for flood water um, for our, our open space and critical habitats. Um, so it concerns me that the, the soccer field would get a higher priority than, um, than open space and, and what would happen in the event of a flood there. Um, And I even highlighted this document to be able to read it easier, and I'm still having a hard time doing it. Um, as, as are we all. Mm -hmm. So you also agreed to appropriate fencing between the properties and a 20 foot setback where 10 is typically required. So there is some acknowledgement on um, encroachment and allowing a bigger distance between the two. Um, but of course, at every recreational field, there is gathering. And um, we have seen that with that age group or if alcohol is allowed, how things sometimes can quickly get a little bigger than intended. Um, and again, with it being so close to um, our critical habitat, it causes me a lot of concern that there could be damage done due to what we allow to be so close to the property. So uh, it, it just, it concerns the, the recreational fields concern me. So 
what um, I have started off, if everyone wants me to read this, yeah. And then we can just see if we move through, if this is something you know we want or don't want, but okay. um, I have written so far, uh, due to uh, open spaces, structural budgetary constraints, our traditional strategic adaptation approaches are obsolete. Research findings presented by staff detail underwhelmingly inadequate resources and finances for high risk expansion without value added and meaningful societal partnership. OSBT recommends information sharing by a structured internal external discussion process that could lead to preparedness for eventualities that might quickly emerge in the CU university landscape. Um, and then from there, we could talk about the unknown potential features um, by listing all of them kind of as Karen has done with um, light pollution, noise pollution, et cetera. Um, or we could say that we feel that the, the fields could be in misalignment with certain portions of the open space charter. I find section 176 EG and H to stick out to me. Um, but that, that's kind of where I'm at so far with that. So what, what we could do, you sort of alluded to this, is we can, as we go through the rest of these, because a number of these are targeted at this buffering that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and we can see if it's sufficient in your eyes, uh, or where we should add a little stronger language, if that if that works for you. Caroline, Karen. if you were if you were to in one sentence say what outcome you would like in your mind the best outcome would be to have what happened with the recreation fields. I think an an understanding of of what intercollegiate sports mean to a university, I would think that on that particular property, they should not be allowed. I, I um, relate to your concerns about runoff, fertilizers, many of the other uh, sort of problems here. I do think the first, uh, the first bullet point of the motion as created has really good conciseness and clarity about us being clear on the OSO portion like of the property. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing that just subtly gives me a little reassurance on this topic is that the most valuable habitat is, um, is, is not gonna be the land directly abutting where Phil showed us the mm -hmm. likelihood of this activity. That's gonna be some of the highest ground on the property. And frankly, it's gonna be, you know, taking good mitigation anywhere near and up close to it is gonna be challenging. So I guess I see that as an off, like a, as one piece of solace on that. The other thing that I'll just not do, and I don't wanna jump ahead, but what you guys have done regarding seeing the open space other as an area for CU to do its own mitigation re requirements on its property seemed like a very creative and innovative solution to meet some of their needs about the impacts that they will have in these other zones. So I, I guess I, those are just a couple of thoughts. Yeah, and I think even when I look at the term sheet kind of um, of what was just said, like where, where are the discussions with that, you know, being an OSO or, or, you know, what is happening with it. Um, it just looking forward into the future. I just feel that the possibility for growth could um, oh, overwhelm us a lot. So. Well, I certainly agree that the issue of what happens on those lands 
is of serious interest to us. And it's, it's something that is not completely defined. I think Phil has alluded to that. And so uh, there are other places where this comes up. And so I do suggest we go through keeping these issues in mind, Caroline, because I think you're right. There's significant uncertainty here that may affect us. And so let's see whether there's places to add more language to this. What this um, number one, now that we're numbering them says, is I, that- Kurt, it, yes. may, may I just interject one thought before you go on with number one? Yes, please. Um, I, the, the clarity, Caroline, with which you said that you think rec fields should not be allowed, in my mind, um, is better communicated as a standalone paragraph, I think. Mm -hmm. And perhaps somewhere near the end, after we've mentioned um, these other things, would be a better place to locate it. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I just, I think with what we're talking about here in all of our, our recommendations, it seems it, you know, a little misaligned with something um, like the rec field. But yeah, I think we should all just keep talking and, and go through it and see if, see what it comes to be at the end of the discussion. But, yeah. but yeah, I agree with you at, at the end, maybe um, talking about it or putting it in there would be good. You know, and so I agree with that. And, and another approach might be to just highlight the word parks uh, in, instead of recreational fields. Um, because I, I think it's not it's unrealistic to think that there aren't going to be open areas, you know, in the in the development. And certainly, I think everyone supports that, but we would probably be more uh, uh, supportive of the notion of parks mm -hmm. rather than recreational fields per se. Yeah, the green. When I look, but when I look at the second row under uh, term sheet item number 11. It gives a specific definition for rec fields. It says that they include concessions, restrooms, storage, uh, mm -hmm. ADA mm -hmm. accessibility, and all those other things mm -hmm. in that second row there. So I, in my mind, it's not just recreation fields, it's recreation fields plus all of those additional things that CU has used to define what rec fields refers to. It'll be an intercollegiate sports complex to some yep. extent. I mean, they're, they're a very large, well-known university. And of course they could probably build something, you know, very big there. Um, I think that what you speak of Dave about the green spaces is beautiful and wonderful. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, it, if they wanted to, it, it could look great and, and their students could love it, but um, <clears throat> fields are there for revenue. And, and so of course that will drive traffic and expansion. So I, um, I just think I, it's something we should think about. I think, you, I think you make a key point there, Caroline, though, that what many of our asks incorporated in this have um, you know, economic ramifications for the university. To ask them not to build rec fields on a part of their property that is their own is a very material and significant ask. Not one I personally think should be taken lightly. And I, I, I just, I feel like we would want to tread with caution there. I'm interested in the impacts of that on open space, runoff, fertilizers, et cetera. But <clears throat> Getting getting into using using this board to tell them what they should and should not build there to a high level of specificity seems like we we run a little off track to me. But that's just I I agree with you that it that it's a kind of a, a high risk uh, recommendation if you will. But if you look <clears throat> at the our other recommendations, it I just. I felt like um, I would be doing open space a disservice to not speak of it, whether or not it, you know, maybe makes a few people uncomfortable. It, 
-hmm. it presents itself as, as something of concern to me. Let's ask Phil to weigh in on this because um, right now there are two sports that are intercollegiate sports that are competed on CU South. One is cross country and the other is tennis. Uh, in terms of recreation fields, unless something dramatically changes, uh, the only other CU intercollegiate sports that could be competed there would be soccer or lacrosse. And they already have those facilities on campus. So I don't know, Phil, what's your sense? Are you seeing the university wanting to hold additional intercollegiate competitions beyond tennis and cross country on CU South? No, I don't think they know. Um, uh, Cause I think what, if they were here, they probably would say that they will need to go through a, their own planning master planning process to determine that. And so that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, that's the challenge with the whole project. And so what we're trying to do is to do those guardrails um, to determine what will and, and will not go there, um, perhaps more importantly. And so um, what we are looking at is um, what we would prefer are lower impact kind of fields. Like you're talking about lacrosse, soccer fields. We are interested in, and stated our parks department of running track um, and perhaps an area for off leash dogs. Um, but, um, you know, I would say also that that topic is not resolved. And so if you have input and I'm <coughs> taking notes, okay. as going, um, especially around things like as an adjacent property owner, it's a, it's, it's um, similar to like a neighborhood next, next door to something like this. And so, um, and in, in addition to your for, more former role, former role in open space, but runoff fertilizer from fields and things like that, that's these sorts of things are really helpful to hear. Well, I think Caroline, you, you've identified an issue that we could add some words about basically saying that, you know, while we understand the university has this desire to have these athletic fields, recreation fields, we would be concerned if the size and scope of these activities became much larger, more formalized, more people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think it's one thing to have fields where, um, you know, people can kick around a soccer ball. It's, it's another thing to start holding new intercollegiate competitions right there. And we already speak to the issue of uh, loudspeaker systems and things like that. Right. And as, as budget cuts happen and, and people look for additional sources of revenue, I just feel that that area would be quite tempting in the future. And again, you never know. It, the name just pops up to me. But if you, you have an athlete that turns into a Tim Tebow and what typically is an event that really doesn't draw a lot of people becomes extremely popular, you know, that, of course, that has the potential as well. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that the board has grave concerns about both the identification and use of proposed recreational fields. Yeah, and, I think we could have language we, like that. And, and are you suggesting that that needs to be part of number one or a separate item? That's what's hanging me up. I think it should be separate. Yeah. Okay. I would agree. All right. I'm gonna, you, I'm gonna stand out as a little mixed. Uh, you may think there's unanimity here, but I'm a little mixed on this. Uh, and how um, your concern? Is anybody, I think it's a is anybody one. arguing it for for it to be part of number one? No. Okay. So uh, let's yeah. take it. Let's take it up at the end uh, and see what issues have not been covered there. I, I think taking it up near the final section on trails will be interesting because I, I have a couple comments that are going to be maybe out of consensus on that one too. Okay, we'll look forward to that. Okay, um, so does anyone have any other amendment for number one uh, per se? Seeing none, I will go to number two, which is titled Transferred Costs of Floodplain Restoration. Proposed Amendments of Language. Out. I think the word very is unnecessary. Where it says the first sentence, the OSB, he is very concerned. Yep. Yep. I, I'm happy to strike 
very. I, I think you also did a great job being very clear in this one. And it, it's, it stands on its own two legs uh, very firmly. Um, as uh, you know, this, this was, Kurt, as you know, I did a lot of thinking about this one too. The only yeah. uh, mixed feeling that I, that I have about this was our decision to remove any discussion about um, what, I, what I see as a critical part of the history. And that is that the actions that are listed in this part of the motion, which the university took historically, were specifically warned against at multiple moments in the process by the city formally, by the county formally, by the CCHE formally. And I understand why people don't want it in there, but I also understand why I'm speaking about that for the public record now, because it's, it's very much part of my belief of why this is just in, in a fair way of looking at it, because they were advised the whole way that this was gonna create problems for flood mitigation. And so they cannot act surprised by the fact that what they did do created problems for flood mitigation and the environmental concerns related. So um, I'm okay with that coming out, but I just wanted to state it publicly that there's a long history there that's important to follow where they specifically went against the advice of the county, the city and the CCHE. Very good, Hal. I, I mean, I think we could try to fit in a parenthetical about that, but I think, yes, it might be too much detail. I think the ask is clear, and I think people are unanimous about the nature of the ask, and that's what's important. Okay, thank you. Uh, other thoughts on number two here? I just want to point out something that Hal has already mentioned, which is the second paragraph in number two is not something that we discussed Good at point. our study session, but uh, is something that um, Kurt suggested as we were trying to create this document and I thought was a reasonable idea. So we we inserted it even though it was not part of our study session discussion. So I wanna make sure everybody knows the origin of that second paragraph. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Karen. Um, what we said in our study session, and you know, we covered a lot of things quickly, is that we didn't want more of the OSO to be used by the university. Uh, you know, we were trying to sort of put our arms around it. But the idea here is if the university has to mitigate impacts to listed species, and they want to pay for that mitigation to happen on the OSO to recreate wetlands or habitat, I think that's fine. It might actually reduce our costs for, for mitigation. So that's where we ended up on this. But thank you, Karen. Yes, it is a, a bit of a change of direction. I concur. I think it sounds fine. It's a good idea. Anything else on number two? Could I yeah. chime in from a staff perspective? Uh, it, yeah, go ahead, Dan. Did you want to chime in and then we'll have- Yeah, to... just um, um, the, on the one, two, fourth sentence or fourth line down uh, and shifted the costs onto the city and the OSMP. OSMP is part of the city. Um, so I'm just wondering, and you know, part of OSMP staff feeling is that we shouldn't be bearing much costs, maybe not at all out here. So a friendly amendment could be onto the city, comma, including potentially the OSMP instead of like I think that would from be the fine. city. I think that would be fine clarification. I mean, the thinking was fairly simple that um, in our previous motions, we say well, a certain amount of restoration should be a project cost, flood project cost. And so that's a, that's a city cost. And other parts of the restoration would be paid for by OSMP, which might come out of the open space fund. So, but I think your proposed change is fine if you, if you wanna go with that. And Leah, did you get that? 
I think so, Dan, in the second paragraph saying in return, the city, including potentially OSMP would make and then go on. No, it's it's in the first paragraph of number oh, two. Oh, then I didn't get it. Okay. First fourth. paragraph, fourth line. Um, it says shifted the costs onto the city. Comma. Comma, including potentially the OSMP. Oh. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, and, and I guess there is that clarification in the second paragraph. If we just want to put city slash OSMP, just but yeah, that, so in return the city slash OSMP, I think that's fine at the beginning of the second paragraph. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, other thoughts on this, Al? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, my my main point is different. I will say, Dan, I I I see where you're headed, but also think about how much staff time has already gone into the discussion alone about how we're gonna mitigate around these structures. There is very clearly OSMP costs. They may not be as formal, but th th we've already sunk a lot of time and effort into this. Yeah, which begs for the elimination of the word potentially, right, Hal? <laughs> right, yep. It, it feels non-potential to me, but I, I, I'm not gonna resist. Uh, what I am more interested in um, celebrating is what you guys have come up with in the second paragraph here. Um, if I understand this right, um, and I think it's helpful for the public, the concept here in the second paragraph is that the city, uh, is that CU through its own development activities may incur regulatory requirements to do its own mitigation. And in yep. the term sheet, they discussed and foresaw that. And that basically um, through the 119 acres of OSO, we might be able to earmark space so that they can achieve that mitigation in a way that's really high impact and effective um, alongside us. And I really, uh, I just, I thought that was a very creative idea that seems to solve that concern and, and bridges gaps. And so I just wanted to say, whoever thought that up, it's quite brilliant. That's our departing chair, <laughs> just for the record. Thank, Thank you. you, Kurt. <laughs> you bet. Uh, so uh, back to you, Dan. I mean, you wanna keep the word potentially in there or just have it be onto the city and the OSMP? What's your druthers? Oh, I, I don't have a strong feeling on that word, staying or going. I'm, I I'm think fine, there's. I'm, I'm fine with comma including the OSMP without the word potentially. Okay, so we'll just drop the word potentially, Leah. Thanks. I'm with you, Hal. I don't think it's very potentially. <laughs> okay. Anything else on this number two before we go on to number three? Okay. Number three is the Dry Creek Ditch shares to enable restoration. Uh, Kurt, I have a suggestion. Um, I think that we ought to clarify the use of the word acquired. And my, my recommendation is that in, rather than acquired, it, sh it should read, should be transferred by CU to OSMP, comma, at no cost to OSMP. Ownership should be transferred. Right. Right. So Dave, I don't disagree. That would be a nice thing. Um, you know, it's just it's just another ask, but what do other board members think? I mean, sometimes people get very jealous about their water rights and... Uh, well, there's no question about that. That's the concern. <laughs> yeah, right. How much will we have to pay is what you're right. saying. <laughs> yeah, Hal. Really for me, oh, I'm sorry, Hal, go ahead. No. Nope. I, I think we, we don't have enough information to really answer that question well. The amount of water that's required to do the mitigation work on site to make up for the previous history of dewatering, I think should come with the deal. But if some of the water rights are gonna be used to the benefit of other OSMP lands, it makes that discussion more complex. Yes. 
but there is, it makes for a discussion. Caroline. I was, just to be kind of frank, I was confused at the last meeting when we were um, asking staff questions about water um, and their feedback was, it was just a bit um, maybe touchy or uncomfortable to talk about these water rights. So it seems like there's, there's some unsaids that are going on. So just to put out, just to put that out there, I feel like um, we don't really know the, the whole picture and, I'm, and I, I'm confused as to why. Yeah, um, from staff perspective, we feel those water rights should be transferred uh, to open space at no cost. So hey, is think, that right? I think the hesitancy is we are not sh uh, totally sure based on the design and what the restoration project ends up looking like, how much of that water is going to be needed at any given year to support the restoration. But what Don was alluding to is that if there's, we certainly have, we would certainly have use within within the jurisdiction of those water rights to use them in other areas if for, a, if for a particular reason it turned out we don't need all the rights to support that restoration in a given year, uh, we're pretty confident they could be used elsewhere uh, on OSP lands with, with, within the jurisdictional limitations of that water right. Well, and as number three points out, uh, this goes to uh, OSBT's ongoing concerns about groundwater. Yes. Well, uh, so Dan, what you're saying, if I understand, is you're saying these water rights are pertinent to the land and therefore whatever ha happens to the land, the water rights should be going with that land. Is there some way that we can phrase our statement to yeah. match your thinking? I don't think that's uh, technically correct, Kurt. In, in typical okay. annexations, the Boulder Revised Code typically would ask a, at least a right of first refusal on water rights. I don't think it's a standard practice that they automatically get transferred over. That's an annexation negotiation. Okay. When space staff is recommending that those water rights be transferred over to the open space department at no cost to support uh, mitigation restoration. Um, but that is not a given to a typical annexation, but that that's our position. But okay. that, the, the Boulder Revised Code or other annexation sort of standards does not demand that. Is, Phil, is that correct? Yes, there is a, an ordinance um, that does talk about us getting the first right to refuse at annexation, um, but I think it is negotiated. I, I do think the balls is kind of in CU court right now. We've stated an interest in, in getting those water rights and their latest um, response was that they're under review by a consultant. And so it's it's on our list of, of items. Yeah, I don't think we should I think split, since, since I don't think we should split hairs here and overanalyze this is what we want and we ought to say it very clearly. Okay. Yeah, and I think since on the term sheets, it, it's a separate item, we should keep it a separate item, to, just for clarity. Okay, so uh, it sounds to me like uh, to be consonant with the department's um, position, we should change this language a little bit to say all remaining ditch water, uh, dry creek ditch water shares should be transferred to OSMP at no cost to support. Right. Does that language work Is for people? Is there something wrong with Dave's language? Dave, would you repeat your language? Yeah, it's, it's the same except for it has by CU. So trans should be transferred by CU to OSMP, comma, at no cost to OSMP, period. Should, should we add one short final sentence that says no restoration is possible on the land without these water rights? Just to make, I mean, you said, Dave, that this is a want of ours, but in fact, it's a need. Hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could do some type of restoration. The desired restoration would not be possible without water rights. We we might want to put uh, uh, should be acquired or should be transferred by CU to open space at no cost to open space 
to a sense to a support a sense or to let's see are essential to support so that 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 gets to your concern Hal, which i think is a good one so we use the it. word essential to support mm -hmm. so let me take a shot at this i think you're saying it would read the transfer of the remaining dry creek ditch water shares to OSMP at no cost is essential to support meaningful land restoration, particularly of the mined area or something like that. Is that close, Dave? Yes. Yeah. Now, if I can fine. remember what I said. Yeah, go ahead, Dan, did you have something? Yeah, um, you know, depending on the, uh, the definition of how the water right could be used, you know, I don't know if we want to be too specific here, but um, as far as how we're able to use ditch shares and in, in, in the terms, but I think is essential to, to supporting OSMP functions on the OSO restoration and functions on the OSO and OSMP lands. Or, but I I feel very strongly about the second phrase there too. Yeah that we need to say to provide supplementary irrigation of areas affected by variant one groundwater disruption. Because I think that's a, having water available for that is really important. So we could put the word essential in there too and say are essential to provide. So it's, there are two essentials for the use of the water. Essential to provide or an essential component. Well, be essential to restore and essential to provide or to supplement or maintain whatever. Okay, let me take a shot at this again. Um, the remain it the remaining dry creek water shares. No, I didn't start it that way. I said what I got, Kurt. What's that? You want me to read what I think I captured? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Leah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that'll help me. So, <laughs> okay, so all remaining dry creek ditch water shares should be transferred by CU to OSMP at no cost to OSMP. And then I have are essential to support land restoration, particularly of the mined area. And then it continues and essential to provide supplemental irrigation of areas affected by variant one groundwater disruption. And, and I'd just like to make sure, Dan, does that meet your needs? I, I want your needs to be met on this. John Potter is shaking his head no. I can see that on my screen. <laughs> yeah. Please, John. I think We're, the groundwater disruption could be an issue. Yeah, yeah, I, a few things. I just think, so um, please speak your mind, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Dan was on the right track with not, not really um, talking about the use of the water. Uh, other than for OSMP purposes, uh, just just is probably a good practice not to um, not to to predetermine what a water right could be used for, and um, and also I uh, when you talk about remaining Dry Creek shares, do you mean remaining after CU figures out what they need? That's a good question, John. And we tried wording this many different ways, so. Please uh, help us out. What would you say? The, the way um, staff have been conveying it to the folks working on the annexation is uh, that, and what we thought the board wanted was uh, to convey all of CU's uh, water interest in water rights to the city, essentially. And that's it. OK. Uh, but don't you think it needs to specify OSMP? Um, no, I mean, that's, that's what we're, we'll be working with um, the uh, flood project. And I would expect would be a requirement of um, any disposal that you might do. I guess, John, I'm concerned that I, I think at least if we talk about restoration, um, that that uh, 
explains the need, the potential need, the general need for the water, and it it applies to the specific site and specific use. Um, I think you know, which means that CU might be more, somewhat more amenable to considering that transfer. Whereas John. if you leave it open ended, then you know <laughs> they have a legitimate claim of well, you know, you're just asking us for water that. Uh, we have no idea what you're going to do with it. And yeah, but that if that's one of the um, the terms that you you would like to recommend council to consider, I think um, that would go a long way. Can't we just say for restoration and mitigation? I, personally, I wouldn't do that, but um, it, it's up to you guys. So my, my analysis of, of what I'm hearing is, is that we have on the one hand political purposes of trying to convince the city council of what we're trying to do for their clarity. But I'm also hearing the department is looking at another element of this that is equally as important. And I'm coming around to the idea that we should defer to John and Dan's view on this for that reason. I mean, I, I, you know, just I, if for uh, for OSMP purposes, um, including potential purposes and use of on the OSO, or I mean, that's even fine. Just saying for future for future OSBT or um, OSMP purposes, does that help? help? I, I'm sort of with where Dave and Karen are in that we've, we've made a very strong pitch about the need for floodplain restoration. Um, and I do think we need to tie this to that. And so I would agree we should try to retain the language of floodplain restoration and maintenance, and that can include the groundwater part. Um, but I'm also looking for ways to not imply that that would be necessarily the only use for it. Um, but could we say that, that in future needs? Yeah, and just, I mean, because water rights, water law is so complicated. Yes. We'll assume, which we haven't done the microanalysis of the water rights, for instance, uh, to tie it to disruption of groundwater, the disruption, mm -hmm. for instance, in the use of the water rights. I mean, that could be problematic. Um, from a water rights perspective and a use perspective. So again, I think the more you micro drill into specifically how we intend to use the water, I think it could be problematical. So that's just a recommendation. And the last thing we want to do is head to water court. <laughs> so what we could say is then that uh, reserved for open space purposes, including restoration, you know, the language on restoration. Is, is there any reason why it's a problem to just make this a single sentence, the first sentence, basically with that transfer change and cut out all additional uh, embellishment? I, I, I feel like we'd be strong there and maybe even that simplicity communicates the political point we want in a different way. I, I just think we've got to clarify what all remaining dry creek ditch water shares means because I brought that up when Kurt and I were talking about this and I, it's not clear to me what all remaining dry creek ditch water shares is. I agree well, with that too, yep. I, I just I, feel like what John and Dan are saying, they're trying to keep us out of trouble on this and, yeah. I'm, and I would like to follow along with them on that. So what it, what shares is it that we're talking about? Can John or, or Dan tell us? I, I think what John said, and I've tried to write it down here, is the transfer of CU water shares in the Dry Creek Ditch to the city at no cost. That's all of their shares. Right. Is that where you were going, John? Uh, yeah, and simpler than that, Kurt, I would just say uh, and any any water rights associated with CU South. Oh, so yeah. the Dry Creek Ditch isn't the only thing we might be talking about. Don't totally know that yet, uh, but 
again, typically on an annexation, the city, uh, as, as Phil mentioned, this, the city can, can ask for a right of first refusal, or in many cases, we ask for the water rights as part of the annexation. Um, in this case, I would just say, you know, a, a possible recommendation that you could have is uh, to transfer all of the water rights associated with CU South to the city for OSMP purposes or something like that. I mean, that okay. would be a very simple, direct way to say what I think you guys want to do, but. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that too, except John, you know, the university is gonna want some water to irrigate their yeah. undeveloped land. And so it's, it's not like they're gonna say, oh yeah, you can have everything we got. Well, they're, we're giving them water. You, you mean we're giving them city water? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that that's um, good advice from John because I, I feel like in the last meeting that what I found to be confusing was a feeling of underlying tone that perhaps we don't know um, everything. Like we're talking about dry creek ditch shares, but that might not be everything we should be talking about or that's available to us right now. Okay, um, I'm gonna give you another version then here. Okay, is this number three? I've forgotten already. Yes, it is. Okay, so here, here's a reading. Number three, water rights to support floodplain restoration. Colon, that's the title. The, I'm going to put a couple more words in here. Okay, the OSPT recommends transfer of CU water rights associated with the CU South property to the city at no cost for OSMP purposes. Purposes, what's purposes in there for? I'm, I'm fine with that, personally. What's the word purposes hanging on the end for? Well, it's for OSMP purposes. Oh, oh, Roger. at no cost to OSMP for OSMP purposes. Well, it's the way it read is to the city at no cost for OSMP purposes. I can read it again here. The title is Water Rights to Support Floodplain Restoration. At least we've got a link there to what we've been talking about. The OSBT recommends transfer of CU water rights associated with the CU South property to the city at no cost for OSMP purposes. That sounds good to me. And it Leah, could be do you have that? Yes, and that's replacing the previous number three. Is that correct? That's correct. It replaces the whole thing. Okay. So we still have that bracket, though, at the end that says number 24. Yeah. Okay. And we can, yeah, Karen, go ahead. Can we have one final reading? Yes. Let's Leah, let Leah read it. Leah, do you want it? Yeah. Yeah, talk about being put to the test. Okay, so the title would be water rights to support restoration. And then the content underneath it would be the OSBT recommends the transfer of CU water rights associated with the CU South property to the city at no cost for OSMP purposes. The last phrase once again is for OSMP purposes. For OSMP purposes, yeah. Okay. Okay. It, it, and I, we appreciate staff's input here. It's This is really important. Thank you. It, and um, Kurt, one last suggestion might yeah. be um, to transfer the, the title to the water to the water rights. Transfer of the title, transfer um, title to the water rights to the city or something like that. 
I, I lost a little bit what Leah was was saying, but sorry. And so right now it just sorry. it just says transfer of CU water rights. Are you saying transfer of title to CU water rights? To, okay, yeah. you can yeah. add that in, Leah. So it says the OSBT recommends transfer of the title to CU water rights. Okay. The good next thing, one. It, good thing there's not a water attorney on the board. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> um, I, don't get me started on water attorney jokes. Okay. <laughs> the next one is number four. Minimizing light and noise pollution from the CU South development. Uh, what happened to protecting the South Boulder uh, Creek? You yeah, you skipped one. I'm sorry. Yeah, I scrolled too fast. You know <laughs> I'm going to come out of my skin if you skip over that one. Number four, protecting the South Boulder Creek view shed. Proposed amendments. Um, as opposed to um, is a, are a major feature of this landscape. Um, I don't know if we should say um, OSMP or the city of Boulder. And, and tell us where you are in there, Caroline. Views to the west. Okay. The South Boulder C Creek Trail are a major feature of this landscape. So where it says this landscape to leave it or make it a little more wordy and say the city of Boulder or OSMP. Hmm. It's a good point. We leave it sort of vague there, don't we? Um, we all we say is it's the South Boulder Creek view shed. That's what the word this landscape refers to. But are you suggesting we should be a little bit more geographically specific or, or what? Mm, well, Karen, do you think views to the West? Well, uh, the only adjective that I would insert is repeating South Boulder Creek, which means that it would say views to the West from the South Boulder Creek Trail are a major feature of the South Boulder Creek landscape. And I'm not sure we need to say South Boulder Creek twice, but it would make it perfectly clear. No, I, I see what you're saying. Now, when um, I initially read it, like the first read of it, I don't know that I quite understood that we were saying that that is the area just because it's so expansive here in Boulder, you can, you know, you have that view from a lot of different places. but that is specifically the area we're talking about. So I might disregard my own suggestion. <laughs> okay, well, keep it in mind. Uh, other thoughts on this uh, paragraph? Okay, going once. Going twice. Okay, I'm on to number five, I think it is now. Minimizing light and noise pollution from the CU South development. I have a, a philosophical question here. Yeah. Um, an annexation is fundamentally an invitation into the city, a city which has probably done more thinking about its own um, ordinances probably than most in the nation. Um, I'm wondering, I, I imagine that you had reasons to do the way you did, and I'm looking to learn what those reasons are. Um, <laughs> but the simpler way to handle this would be to require that the university comply with the city's outdoor lighting and noise ordinances, and then we'd have two sentences. Help me understand why we're adding complexity. Right. I think it's a fair question, uh, Hal. 
when I read the Boulder Revised Codes, both for lighting and noise, I saw a lot of reference to larger institutions and entities. Um, the, the codes, as I read them, are written for residential areas. And if you are a residence in a residential area, you have to do certain things very clearly spelled out. If you are a large institution, not so much. It, it's too bad we don't have somebody from planning here. Oh, we do. <laughs> Phil, do you wanna weigh in on this? Cause we're grappling with things that we don't fully perhaps understand. Yeah, and I, with this particular item, um, we're halfway there in that we've gotten the university to agree to comply with our light, outdoor lighting standards. And so if, if it's in our code, then it would be memorialized through, through this agreement. We, noise is not something that we've, we've addressed, but, and so it's good to hear your, your interest and concerns there. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert on the lighting ordinance and it's been several months since I've read it um, as part of this, this process. And so we might have to get back to you about that. But if there's things, particular things you're concerned about, I do know there was discussion a while ago and I think a lot of our standards and these universities are pretty similar. So like our transportation plans are similar, our lighting standards are similar. Ours are a little bit more stringent oftentimes. And I think that's the case with lighting. Al, uh, do you want to then add comment? I mean, is are you saying well? Well, I, I, it's not so much comment. I mean, I hear Karen saying that she's concerned exemptions exist um, within the code, and as I actually visualize the the project in practice, if it is going to be largely uh, housing and academic use it would seem that the residential code for the city of Boulder is probably good enough for the new community that's entering our city. But then you have the potential for um, recreational fields and elsewhere, which anyway, I, I, yeah. I now understand what you're doing there. But given what Phil said, did, did what Phil said give you confidence <laughs> enough to simply ask for compliance with the outdoor lighting ordinance? Not yeah, when those, I read it. Those regulations are insufficient, I think, for this particular area. And all you have to do is walk by CU at any point at night and, and try to envision yourself on open space with that kind of uh, lighting situation. I don't think there's any way to mitigate the impacts from noise and lighting on the open space. And so this is kind of a, a worst case scenario. And so, we ought to be as rigorous as we can. And we ought to say that, you know, there should be no noise or light, you know, that comes onto open space off that property. Well, and, and I guess that's my problem because the ordinances give spe specific decibel and lumen values, which are measurable and forcible. And frankly, the sentence to not allow noise or light off the boundaries of the property is a, is a physics impossibility. That's correct. So I think we shouldn't be myopic to think that we're gonna mitigate impacts from noise and light. So if, if I read this, uh, the first paragraph basically describes our interests. And I think sometimes when you don't know just either what's gonna be developed or what the code will say, it's good to state what your interest is. And we end by saying, therefore adherence to the city's lighting standards is really important. So in case of lighting, we are endorsing the city's lighting standards, but we're going maybe further and saying, here's why we're concerned. The second one for noise, we, I mean, you're right, how we do not call out the city's noise ordinances. And, you know, maybe we should do that. Um, uh, and Caroline, you got your hand up too. Hal, did you just want to respond uh, about noise particularly? The well, noise and, ordinance? Yeah, and just the way, the way I, I, I really do respect and see where you're going, but essentially what you're asking is city council to create another parallel ordinance that somehow is enforceable and measurable and, and et cetera. 
and my point is, I, I agree with these points, but I see the likelihood of action coming from them as low because they're not sp highly specific or we didn't do enough homework ourselves to write that parallel guideline. Caroline, go ahead. Um, just to clarify, Phil, did you say that CU um, has, as of now, agreed to the, um, the light? Yeah, they'll, there's some things in our code that are intended for a private property owner that we're going to have to tweak the wording. The standards will stay just so that it works in this particular case. And I am looking and, and I'm seeing language around pro prohib um, prohibitions of, you know, any lamp or bulb except for seasonal displays, which is visible beyond the property line on which it's located. Um, and so there's, I think, taking those concerns and doing another run through the city's code um, would be helpful. Um, I think we understand them um, pretty well. So how kind of like what you were saying for the city council to go back and create an entirely new ordinance for them, it seems that they wouldn't need to do that if they decided to strike the recreational facilities and what you were saying with the housing that they want and the um, academic buildings that it would hold true, but it, it, it would bring in yeah. more complexity to have the yeah, we, we prefer in the or in the annexation ordinance to probably say to reference a code and then as amended. And so as we make tweaks, it also applies to this property. And the, the lighting code does in, does address the residential, commercial and public uses. Um, and so um, it's there if, if they're not um, stringent enough, we can let's let's talk about it. If there's concerns about seeing that light and that trespass and what that might the implications of, of the open space, what that might and have. We can we say residential lighting code um, standard rather than than uh, commercial? In uh, what are the three words? Yeah, so there's it really covers everything: residential, commercial, mixed use, public, our, our current ordinance. Yeah. So just to be specific, Hal, regarding the recreation fields, there's nothing. I mean, let me ask you, is, is there anything in the annexation agreement as you're anticipating it now that would prohibit them from putting up lights on the recreation field so that they could be used at nighttime? Uh, no, I mean, I, it, it seems that much is clear. I'm just, I'm just pointing out that I, I, I think where you're headed is in the right direction, but I'm wondering who's gonna do the work to actually figure out how to codify that. Phil's gonna do that. Yeah. Phil, <laughs> Phil did, is what you said earlier that um, CU has agreed to abide by the, the residential standards that are in the code? I'm saying all of them because we'll see some we, yeah. residential as well, which would include limits to um, any lighting poles for recreational use, whether that's public or private. I, I'm not clear what you just said. Um, Say it more specifically. Um, so no, we we right now are anticipating if it's a commercial use, the commercial standards would apply. Um, so if it's an academic use or something like that, if it's a residential use, then the residential standards would apply. Okay, so if they if they get into um, using the public and commercial lighting standards, that's gonna have virtually no protection for the open space lands. It's, yeah. only if they, it's only if they're required to stay with the residential standards that I would feel comfortable leaving it with this compliance with the city residential standards. See, I think the language should be as rigorous as we can make it. And Hal, to your point, you know, somehow we came up with the uh, lumen and audio standards for the regulations. We can come up with more rigorous ones. And, you know, there are people that do that. And so that's what I'm saying, that we should send that message to council that we don't think the current regulations are sufficient 
to mitigate the potential impacts on open space from a, this development. That, that sentence sounds really concise to me. Uh, maybe we should kind of open up right with that to introduce. Caroline, do you want to jump in? Even if they wanted um, to be compliant or agreed to residential lighting, depending on crowds, how would we regulate that? So if, if the city came to a, a conclusion for light and sound and everyone was okay with that, but then three times a week, there's an event with X amount of people, you know. Well, I think that's why I asked Phil if there was any expectation that the university would be installing uh, field lights for nighttime use of fields, because I think that's a, a very specific area or example where we would be very concerned. Maybe it's time to abort this discussion about number five and take a little sidebar trip uh, and consider Caroline's wording for a number six. Uh, uh, Karen, I just want to give Ch uh, Phil a chance to, he, he okay. never did get a chance to reply to my question about athletic field lighting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking yes, but the rec fields are still up in the air. We haven't gotten a response about the location of them. And I think once we can resolve that, we would move into some of those more specific standards. Right now, the outdoor lighting code does allow for, or yeah. do what could happen, you know? Yeah, um, and, and so Dave, you folks added, or Karen added, uh, Da, 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 a, a point about the, the standards must define exactly how lighting and noise will be confined solely within the property boundaries. And that certainly would not allow for athletic field lighting uh, for nighttime events. I, I guess that's why you were going in that direction. Right. And I, I can see your point. Caroline? It's not what we're talking about with noise and light, so don't don't shoot the messenger. But when they, I, I just don't want it to get lost in the discussion. The the other portion that really concerned me is they were talking about um, the grading. You know, it, it has to be specific for their sports field, and if they are allowed to have it to whatever degree necessary to make it um, what it needs to be for um, sports to be able to be done on there. How, how does that impact us as well? Like with, with runoff or, I, you know, I just. Yeah, Brandon, Brandon's team is responsible for that. I see him actually logging on right now. And so he might be able to. to talk. Hi, Brandon. <laughs> but I think before Brandon, actually, I just wrote down, I think what I'm really hearing is a real concern around glare around like if you were specifically to measure it like lumens at the property line and so some specific things to look for to enforce it because that's what we're looking to do and in, in receiving like a lighting cut sheet with their plans to review and stuff like that and so um, this is helpful to hear those concerns great thanks and and you know we're really happy that you guys are here to hear this but we need to finish and vote on a motion to council. And so I guess we're trying to figure out, uh, I mean, one way to do this, and maybe this is the direction that I was going, but I don't know, um, is to say we, we feel strongly that noise and lighting needs to be designed and managed so that it doesn't escape the property lines for all of these good reasons that we mentioned in the first paragraph. I, I guess, uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm a slightly in a different spot. My point is, when you read the code, they define at the property line a level of lumens and a level of decibels that can leave a property line. Th this place, it will be visible. The light coming off of it could be seen from space. Um, <laughs> That's true. The, the yeah. sound will. So what we need to do if, if to get moving on the motion, for me at least, I think is like the sentence that says how lighting and noise will be confined solely within the property boundaries. Since that's just not possible, 
to say how lighting and noise will be uh, uh, measured and enforced <clears throat> At, at the property line, something that we can actually achieve or do, you know? Yeah, no, I, I understand about making this something that's concrete and measurable and references um, a regulation. I think the, one of the things we're grappling with is that the city lighting standards allow for a lot of things, including having nighttime lit ball fields uh, seven days a week. Sure. And I think rock we're trying to figure rock out concerts seven days a week for well, right to, yeah as opposed to residences. And so how do we grapple with that? I I'm not sure. I think there is an effort to describe what our interests are, which is to not have a lot of light and noise pollution uh, that doesn't exist today uh, that would significantly affect the experience on open space. Um, So, I mean, that's in the first couple of sentences uh, and we could, you know, we could just leave it at that, recognizing that we can't endorse a particular um, city code because we're not sure what that would allow. So we just end up stating strongly our concerns about noise and light pollution. That's one approach. Kyle, unless you, um think otherwise, I feel like to, to do what you want to do, which is to put numbers on it and be able to start talking about it, the, the only way to really do that, as, as far as I see it right now, is to make it residential for the um, housing and the academic buildings. And then I, it... I, 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 don't, I don't think we have to do that necessarily. I'm just saying I think it's poorly written constructed by using an impossibility in the language of the motion. And it shows lack of sophistication by our board to understand what the actual outcome might be or look like. Right. No, I, I agree with you um, with that point. I just. Can, can I try? Can I can I try just a friendly amendment really quickly? Yeah. To see, to see point where I'm headed. In the yeah. sentence that says how lighting and noise will be confined solely within the property boundaries, um, you could say how lighting and noise will be limited and measured at the property boundaries. Um, I, I think that's helpful, uh, Dave. The next thing you say though, I'm assuming this was a sentence you would propose, the next thing it says is meet city regulations. Well, city regulations can allow a whole lot of noise and light to go everywhere. So I'm almost leaning towards dropping out references to city regulations, unless we just wanna say the Open Space Board is concerned that city regulations would not be sufficient to protect open space from substantial noise and light pollution. Yeah, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm in fact, even okay with uh, Hal's suggestion. Um, if, as long as we can put some kind of language in there, it said need, needs to be limited to the extent possible or something like that um, to minimize impacts. It, it just strikes That's me too, that too easily. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna end up with, uh, you know, council just doing a shrug and saying, well, yeah, yeah. We already got the regulations. <clears throat> And I think we ought to we ought to make it clear that this area requires more rigorous regulatory uh, treatment than currently exists. And I don't know what those are, but someone should be able to determine those. Does anyone else need a five minute break? Right yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and I think it will help us to think about this too. So let's, uh, we'll, let's be in recess until 9.15 and we'll all come back with really good wording. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Welcome back. And uh, Caroline, thank you very much for 
making a motion to take my breath. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to propose something uh, because I understand very well that this is where Tom Isaacson would have come up with three sentences that beautifully captures everything we're thinking. So this is my attempt. Um, what I'm basically going to, what I'm trying to do here is retain the first couple of sentences that talk about how critical uh, the quiet and the darkness is for the open space that we wrote uh, in the original, the original motion. And then I'm just gonna try to add a couple sentences that captures our general concern. So here we go. Um, the topic is minimizing light and noise pollution from the CU South development. And I'm keeping the first two sentences. I think it's the first two sentences. Yeah, <clears throat> I will read it though. The CU South development has the potential to significantly degrade the habitat quality and the visitor experience on the OSMP slash state natural area by introducing light and noise pollution that does not exist today. Currently, this area is very quiet and has relatively good dark skies, which are both important features of our open space. Now, here's my attempt at a general statement of concern that the council and staff would try to convert into specific negotiated agreements. OSBT is concerned that adherence only to the city's lighting and noise ordinances may not be sufficient to protect the special user experiment experience and habitat in the adjoining open space areas. The city should take steps to ensure that the university will minimize light and noise impacts on adjacent lands, particularly, for example, from nighttime lighting or amplified sound systems, which might otherwise be allowed under city codes. Caroline. I think it's just also important to highlight um, the disappearance of wildlife due to a lot of noise and stuff. You know, a lot of people go out to open space to see the animals and if we constantly are disturbing their habitat, they are going to go elsewhere as we kind of see now with, um, you know, the dogs on open space. So I've got that first sentence that says, uh, OSBT is concerned that adherence only. Now I'm gonna go back to the first sentence. So we say the CU South development has the potential to significantly degrade the habitat quality. Should I insert after that wildlife populations? or re, we could say reduce the Air habitat community. quality, reduce the habitat quality. I would say comma, comma, presence of wildlife, comma, and the visitor experience. I think saying the disappearance of wildlife, that, that word disappearance of wildlife due to it um, speaks loudly. Well, I think that's what we're saying. We're saying that there's, the noise and light pollution could reduce habitat quality, presence of wildlife, and the visitor experience. I, I, I see what you're saying and it, it does make sense. I just feel like um, that saying, using, sorry, can you read it, read those three again for me? Yeah, this is the first, the first sentence. It would say the CU South development has the potential to, to significantly reduce the habitat quality, presence of wildlife, and the visitor experience on the open space natural area by introducing light and noise pollution that does not exist today. Reduce habitat quality. Okay, just read on um, that, reduce habitat quality, and then the two. The, it reduces habitat quality, presence of wildlife, and the visitor experience. Or increases or, the disappearance. I, I don't know, I just feel like, um, at least in my head, but you, everyone else can weigh in, but. The stem is significantly degrade. Yeah, or right. So all those things are significantly degraded. The habitat quality is significantly degraded. The presence of wildlife is significantly degraded and the visitor experience is significantly degraded. 
I just feel like when you hear presence of wildlife, if you're reading it not carefully, it, it could not um, transfer the same, even though we know we're all saying, you know, that it would reduce animal population in the area. I don't know. Well, what if we say, reduce the habitat quality, wildlife populations, and the visitor experience. So it's reducing wildlife populations. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Uh, so general thoughts about this approach. It's got two sentences about why this area can be significantly damaged by noise and light pollution. And then it goes on to say, we, we don't think these open space values will be necessarily protected or that the city's lighting and noise ordinances may not be sufficient to protect these values. And then that the city should take steps to ensure uh, minimal light and noise impacts on adjacent lands, particularly for example, from nighttime lighting or amplified sound systems, which might otherwise be allowed under city codes. And I'm happy to expand this. This was just an effort to shorten it and to not be particularly endorsing city codes because we're not sure if they would be sufficient one way or the other. The, the only thing that I would like to suggest, Kurt, is not may not be sufficient, but will not be sufficient. Okay, got it. So it would say OSBT is concerned that adherence only to the city's lighting and noise, noise ordinances will not be sufficient. Um, and, and can I make a suggestion there? Should, should yeah. we say, and discrete requirements will be required to preserve open space values? To just be clear that we're gonna be looking out for discrete requirements. Um, yeah, I'm not attached so I, to it, but. I, I could change the second sentence in the second paragraph to say the city should develop discrete requirements to ensure. Great. So I'll, I'll read that sentence and see if it strikes you how the city, well, I'm going to read the whole paragraph again. OSBT is concerned that adherence only to the city's lighting and noise ordinances will not be sufficient to protect the special use experience and habitat in the adjoining open space areas. The city should develop discrete requirements to ensure that the university will minimize light and noise impacts on adjacent lands, particularly, for example, from nighttime lighting or amplified sound systems, which might otherwise be allowed under city codes. Is it will minimize or is it will prevent? Well, it's a fair question. Um, well, we could say prevent significant light and noise impacts. So we're not saying you'll completely avoid photons escaping the property. Um, <laughs> I rather like that though, Kurt. Yeah. <laughs> Um, to ensure that the university will prevent significant light and noise impacts on adjacent lands. Leah, are you tracking any of what I'm saying here? Well, I, I think so. She's got it all. You know her. Yeah. Well, I tell you what. Um, Kurt? Yeah. Uh, Dave, go ahead. I have a couple of questions. I think we ought to use the word specific rather than discrete. Okay, Dis yep. Discrete kind of uh, is a little funky, I think, in this context. Yep. And then okay. significant, you know, we're going to get in the weeds again with significant because, yep. well, that's not significant. And so I guess I would just say let's leave that word, that adjective off or out 
if you look at the charter, um, if we are talking about section 176 open space purposes, H does say preservation of land for its aesthetic or passive recreational value and its contrib contribution to the quality of life of the community. So, you know, it's, it's preventing perhaps what some homeowners on the hill are feeling this week. You know, we don't, we don't want that for open space. I don't, I don't have any idea what you just said, Caroline. <laughs> so, it seems like okay. the last portion of um, what we were coming up with wording is, is that it's written um, under 176H in our charter. I just like to refer back to our charter as much as possible because it just seems to keep everything on track. Yeah, never a bad idea. Um, so, Dave, you're saying strike significant, just say prevent light and noise impacts. And I guess the question for Hal is, does that sound too much like you're putting up a barrier to all photons? Um, no, no, I we... think that's a huge step in the right direction of giving good advice to do something that's actually possible. I'm, I'm happy with that. Okay, so prevent light and noise impacts language okay with you. Okay. Um, and Kurt, I had one other quick suggestion yes. on, uh, yes. on the wildlife deal. We should just say wildlife use. Or I can't remember what the wording is, but it's yeah. re reduce okay. habitat quality, wildlife use, and yep. whatever. Yep. Yeah, I think that's uh, because you're right. We can displace populations and they may stay the same size, but they won't be in this area anymore, right, right. which I think is what Caroline was getting to. Right. Um, so, do you want another reading of that, or are we sort of okay to continue on? Okay, because eventually I or Leah, I hope it's Leah, We'll read this whole thing. Well, she'll put it up on the screen. And so we'll we'll give everybody a chance to read the whole thing carefully when it's up on the screen before we move to a final motion. I'll be happy, Kurt, if we can get the words migrating photons in there somewhere. Okay. <laughs> what about alpha particles? Well, that would work too. And okay. we could go and <laughs> My, my question, my question is whether we are eliminating um, the last two sentences of the current number five. And that's where it says the university has multiple venues? Yes. Well, so well, I mean, it's a fair question, uh, Karen. W what I did is to simply say, we're not sure ordinances will be sufficient to prevent nighttime lighting or amplified sound. Um, I understand that. This is yeah. sort of a, a supplemental statement that says there are other places, use them and not this place. Okay, so you're proposing that we take basically um, I think it is the last two sentences. Yep, retain the last two sentences. I'm dealing with both a PDF and a Word document. Uh, you have too many documents. Yeah, okay. You have the trouble with those PDFs. So I'm going to put another word in here that I'm going to say, we said, for example, nighttime lighting, I'm going to say nighttime sports lighting. Uh, because why, then that be why isn't lighting for for some as uh, some kind of strobe lighting for a rock concert equally objectionable. Um. Well, I'm just afraid that nighttime lighting could be your your light over your door that lights up your porch. So, um, 
Well, the last two sentences don't have anything like that in them. So you must be in a different part of the document. Well, the last two sentences I've got is such systems should be strictly prohibited. Is that right? No, the university has multiple venues on existing campuses for music okay. and sports okay. competitions that require amplified sound systems. CU South should not be used for these types of activities. I'm gonna then, I'm gonna suggest we add after amplified sound systems uh, and nighttime lighting. Okay, I'm going to see if I can read all of this, Karen, because I like what you've done here. I'm just trying to adjust a couple words. So uh, the last sentence was that we, uh, the city should develop specific requirements to ensure that the university will prevent light and noise impacts on adjacent lands, particularly, for example, from nighttime sports lighting or amplified sound systems, which might otherwise be allowed under city codes. Then to go on, the university has multiple venues on its existing campuses for musical events and sports competitions that require amplified sound systems and or nighttime lighting. CU South should not be used for these types of activities. So all I did was take the two last sentences and add nighttime lighting uh, to it, to make sure we've got parallel between those last few sentences. I, and now I have to, yeah, yeah, Hal, go ahead. Um, I, I, I support this, I'm not gonna resist it, but I do just wanna point out, Karen and, and Kurt, that yeah. in, pre, in, in the ecosystem cost transference area, we decided to just drop some sentences that that I had proposed related to why to adopt a more specific demand. And just for you know parallel purposes, I think what you stated is very much true, but I, I just wanna flag that. I, I feel like we should decide if we're gonna do wise or not do wise and be <clears> consistent. <throat> I think we should continue and run with this, but uh, I, I hope you see what I'm saying. I do see what you're saying, uh, Hal, is that in those last two sentences, we've gone beyond saying what our concerns are to saying how the university should manage its properties. Because the um, strongest sentence there is such systems should be strictly prohibited on CU South. What they're doing elsewhere is a bit of, it's not as much of our concern, I don't believe. Okay, so you're saying, if I get you right, that the second to the last sentence you would strike as being a little bit uh, going over the fence. Uh, the university has multiple venues, la, 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 la. Uh, so that's not up and, to and I'm not asking you to yeah. strike it. I'm just saying I, I had in the ecosystem cost transference, you guys struck something similar to mine. Well, but it's, I think strategically, it's not a bad suggestion. Karen, do you see where we're going here? Is it we would drop that sentence and it would just go to say, CU South should not be used for these types of activities. Um, does the previous sentence make clear what these types of activities is talking about? Well, it says nighttime sports Can lighting or amplified. Can yeah, Leah put it up on the screen? Can Leah put it up on the screen? Um, yeah, she can try. <laughs> I, I think your question's a good one, Karen. I, I'm not sure it's completely clear uh, when you drop out that sentence, what these types of activities is. And to the extent that you can enlarge that, Leah, it would be enormously appreciated. And, and I'm serious, if you'd like to keep it, I'm, I'm not resisting at all, I'm just, Okay. Saying we are either doing wise or we're not doing wise. Yeah. Uh, well, I appreciate your tolerance for this, uh, Hal. Um, but I, I also appreciate very much your point. Um, so, Karen, I will leave it up to you. You're the author. I'm reading. Of the, uh, 
if you want to leave this in, I think Hal will accommodate that. Okay, is it's people have a chance to scan that whole paragraph? Be sufficient to protect the special use experience and habitat in the adjoining. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask Leah to switch back to the. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm not ready. My fault. Sorry, Leah. The city should develop specific requirements to ensure the university. Um, Leah, there is a couple words that got dropped out because we were doing so much here. Um, one, two, three, four. The fifth line up from the bottom. Yeah, you got it there. It should read light and noise impacts on adjacent lands, particularly, for example, from, because we're not just talking about this. We're saying the general requirement is to prevent light and noise impacts on adjacent lands, particularly, comma, for example, comma, from nighttime sports. And then go directly to the sentence that says, CU South should not be used for these types no, of- No, uh, Hal is saying to leave that next to last sentence in if you want. It was, it was really just more a point on uh, our board philosophy of, do we stick strictly to what we're gonna be requiring or do right. we get into what, explaining a lot about why? And we, in earlier in this, we removed some language about why. I understand I, that. I honored and respected that, you know? Yeah. And I'm fine, I, I'm fine with deleting the highlighted sentence and just going with that one if that's what you want to do. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it seemed, it, at least that's consistent. I agree. Okay, anybody else have any um, Dave, questions? Dave, Caroline. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, okay, thank you all. Uh, Leah, if, can you go back to the, and we'll see where that takes us then. That takes us, if I'm reading this right, to number, is it six? Yes. Thank you. Uh, trails. So, yeah, yeah, Hal, I'm sorry. Yeah, Go right I, ahead. I, I promised a little, um, a little resistance here, and I'm going to make good on that promise right now. Thank you. Um, so I, I fully understand the sentiment behind this proposal, and that is that we're, if we do our job well, we're going to have a sensitive piece of wildlife habitat that will need. Um, very careful visitation usage management. And so I start by honoring that. Stepping back a little bit to the bigger picture, you know, the Open Space Board is attempting to um, create a deal that not only will be beneficial for the whole South Boulder Creek ecosystem complex, 
but one also that I think CU eventually will see is very beneficial to its own interests. Mm -hmm. they'll, 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 they'll see that it's a beautification of their property. They'll see that the view shed that, that you're talking about enhances the value of that property. They'll see um, actually that this is a very good outcome for them. Given that this land was purchased in fee simple by the university, bygones be bygones about the history of how that occurred, and that um, we are going to be asking them to, you know, uh, contribute a significant portion of it to our uh, endangered species restoration. I do not have any problem with them being at the table to discuss how their student body is gonna benefit from that work. And I know it's not your intention in writing this to say that we're trying to put up a wall or block access to it, nor is it my intention to say we should put any trails where the ecosystem don't intend them to be. But given that we've made a lot of comments about how we'd like a more harmonious relationship with the university and their environmental department about what we're doing here, it's my personal view that we really actually would like a beautiful conversation with the university about something that's gonna work well for everybody and that will represent a, a compromise between the preservation and the ability to go see the bird populations that hopefully will be using this area, not only for college students, but for general Boulder residents. And Karen, I will let you talk about your genesis of your concern here, uh, because I, I, th I think there is a middle ground, but go ahead, Karen. I would be happy to have another section that talks about collaboration and cooperation on the restoration and the learning experiences that could be provided, et cetera. Um, my uh, experience over the last three or four years with CU's concept of trails and the linkages from the CU South Campus to the open space in Mountain Park State Natural Area uh, stem from a meeting that was held on the East Campus, I want to say four years ago, um, where CU had maps which showed multiple arrows coming from the CU South Campus over to the State Natural Area. And all the charter purposes and management principles for open space and mountain parks and for state natural areas indicate that that is just an outright non-starter. And so the uh, guiding principles when they were in draft form um, got added a new sentence which says, all trails will follow the standard OSMP process for creation of new trails. And the current uh, term sheet makes it clear that uh, trails will be created at the sole discretion of OSMP and OSBT or something to that effect. It uses the term sole discretion. Um, and that's what I think we need to reiterate here. So Karen, is it your perception that the, the term sheet says what we're saying? Um, the obvious question is, well, then why do we need to say it? Um, what's your because feeling? We need, because we need to be clear and strong. Um, would, would, would it you, be politic to say that um, the OSBT agrees with the statement in the guidelines, the annexation guidelines that says A, B, and C, um, if that language has already been adopted? The language in the guiding principles is Trail connections to open space trails would follow a typical city public process. 
Mm -hmm. Karen, if I could jump in, my, my main issue with how this is written is that the sole discretion of the department and the board, our typical process oh. when we deal with a fairly robust trail planning area is, you know, we do get input from stakeholders and ultimately we typically go to council uh, as part of that decision-making process. Right. So but, I, but in the current, I'm looking for it right now, just a minute. Karen, while you're looking, may I ask Dan a question? Sure. Yeah. Um, do you feel like where the negotiation is or where it's going, Dan, is that they, for lack of a better way to put it, they will get their own fence or they will get their own fences, their own access to open space? Um, <clears throat> Phil, I don't know if, we, if we've had that level of detail of talks and negotiations about uh, fences that swing both ways, fences that swing, gates that swing one way. Um, I, I, I don't think we probably have had that level of conversation, but I may be wrong. Because if it came off their property, most city residents are, aren't going to drive. It would be, it's, it seems like to me, it would be almost exclusively for students to be able to use that. So then it would seem to me like it's Giving yeah. your own fence, but I don't. I just want. To, um, Typically, if there's a if there's a fence on the boundary, if and or a gate on the boundary, it would it would uh, require a license if it was for a specific use, and if it was more generally, the gate would swing both. Ways. Let's have Phil's uh, thoughts. I don't recall something like that, Dan, either. Um, other than what we what you had just mentioned around the approval process for that, we did note that um, all the fences and other um, um, uh, uh, pieces of infrastructure on the open space property um, need to basically um, they, no trespassing, basically <laughs> the clause. So, Karen, did you have language you want to endorse that you're seeing? Uh, I'm on term sheet item 29, the staff response from February 2nd, 2019, which says any roads or trails on land conveyed to the city, including any potential, potential connectors to adjacent city open space, will either be designated by the city and become a part of the city's open space system or abandoned by restoring the underlying land at the city's expense. Designated roads and trails will need to be accessed from designated trailheads and access points OSMP staff would like to remind CU of the following, colon. All OSMP fences and boundaries must be respected at all times and no gates, trail connections or other access points will be allowed from the CU property onto city open space without prior, prior approval from the Open Space Board of Trustees and in accordance with the gate policy of OSMP. And this is the section where it says final determination of any of the above will be at the city's sole discretion. So, um, I mean, is there some, I think what we're saying is we're in agreement with those statements um, from staff on February 2nd. Um, I just you, think we need to have it as a clear statement from the board uh, several of these things are already mentioned in the uh, term sheets. And this is a really important one that I don't think we can just ignore. And, 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 and I and guess I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm all in favor of an item number seven that waxes eloquent about, um, you know, all the possible learning experiences for CU students with the restoration work or 
-hmm. that, that mirrors that mirrors the master plan uh, items that have to do with involvement in city management and restoration of lands and blah, blah. Uh, so I'm gonna circle back to Hal and then we'll get Caroline. Uh, so Hal, yeah. do you have words that you would propose to well, make be, be, because it Because it's contained in the term sheet and because OSMP will ultimately make this decision if the land is transferred to us and be simple. I think that it, this provision in itself, and I, I try to put myself in the shoes of people I negotiate with, stands out more as a stick in the eye as something practical. And I go further to just speak from my own lived experience in college I was fortunate to be able to walk out onto a beautiful hillside at my college and frankly do what I wanted to do, whether that be enjoy bird watching, smoking weed, doing all the things that college students do. And that was part of what invited me into being an environmentalist. And I think that CU being at the table and consulted about this is a good thing. And I don't believe that we want to build a wall between this property and the university. So I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, I, I may well find myself in the minority here, but I don't think it serves our other big important requests earlier in this document. The term sheet contains it. And, and I do think CU should come to the table to talk about this and we should come up with a beautiful solution. Well, if I may make a suggestion on, on this sentence that could include getting voices such as CU at the table is, is towards the end of the sentence, it would be any trails on OSP lands and the regulations that apply to the use of those trails shall be determined through typical OSMP planning processes. And yeah. a typical process would be to seek a recommendation, not approval from the board to seek input from stakeholders, to seek input in, uh, from staff, and probably ultimately to go to the council. Right, and we do say at the beginning, while the city will coordinate with CU, and we could say CU and other stakeholders on various types of blah, 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 and then come back to your language at the end, say uh, locations and regulations, uh, will be identified through normal OSMP planning process. Is that what you're suggesting, Dan? Yeah, because our yeah, because our typical process would be to listen to the community, listen to the stakeholders, listen to the board, and uh, listen to staff, and go to council. Uh, Caroline, jump in now. Dan, I just want you to clarify for me for the section that we're talking about. When I read it. Um, that the larger middle paragraph says the way that things normally are, but then the way that I'm interpreting the last paragraph is the, the middle paragraph is the way that it should be. However, due to the process of annexation negotiation, if the city says um, we're going to allow this property to have a trail, or, am, I, am I reading this wrong? Or are they saying that they could give the property a trail in the negotiations without going through the process as normal? Or am I just reading that wrong? Uh, what is it that you're reading, Caroline? When I read the last sentence, however, final determination on any of the above will be at the city sole discretion. Uh, by, when it says city, do, do they mean um, OSMP staff? Or do well, they- Well, again, at the you know, mm -hmm. typically when when you're in a negotiation between two entities, the city would encompass OSMP. You know that that's what I was trying to say earlier in the evening. That you know we are the city, we're part of the city. So using the word city would imply OSMP. Okay. Uh, I think I think in this in this sheet you're putting together outside of the term sheet, I think you're referring to under this draft language of the motion, I think it's all we really need to do is, is 
Well, I, I was just talking about the term sheet. I just, and, yeah. and if you clarify that and say it will be the, the city's discretion and that means OSMP, that's fine. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that, that with how you were interpreting that. Yeah, unless of course we're talking about some acreage of pub land that's going to be owned and managed by utilities and those of and if there's any talk about having any sort of trail through the mitigation project which i doubt but you know that would capture that as well which that would be city land and the city would have the discretion over in that area as well and that's the area for the um fields no nope. No, uh, no. Just any any of the CU Southlands that would be conveyed through annexation, which would include, right now we're talking OSO lands, and we're also talking lands in order to accommodate uh, use by utilities department for the flood mitigation project. So it's just not the 119 that would need to be conveyed, or or that we're asking to be conveyed through annexation. It's utilities needs lands from CU as well to do their project. So and that's the, that's the PKU land up in the north, right? Yes. So if there's any use of those lands, which, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of, but if there is, that, that city discretion language would apply to the, that land as well, I would imagine. So, so Karen, here's what I've got uh, incorporating, I think, what Dan was saying. Um, and, and Hal, see if this is uh, close. Um, I'm going to try to make it two sentences now. Um, give me a second here. Okay, so this uh, it would start with the city will coordinate with CU on various. Now I'm going to start it differently. Sorry, give me a second here, folks. It's late. Uh, It is expected, it is expected that the city will coordinate with CU and other stakeholders. Let me write that in here. On various types of trails and multimodal access within the PUB and PKU slash O areas. However, this is a second sentence now. However, the location of any trails on OSMP lands and the regulations that apply to the use of those trails must be determined through normal OSMP planning processes. So Kurt, can I, I'll offer as another suggestion. Yeah. Uh, because I can't figure out why we want to refer to, uh, you know, PKUO yeah. and PUB and all that. Well, I don't know. I think we should just say location of trails on open space lands uh, and the regulations yeah. that apply will yeah. follow the you know normal OSMP planning processes, including participation of CU. Uh, well, I absolutely agree with your first suggestion that all this stuff about hub and PKU is kind of beside the point, isn't it? Um, okay, so you're saying just have the sentence that says location of trails i i think the use of the word any is you know is how maybe not stick in the eye but uh, toothpick in the eye it's like location of trails right um okay we'll follow, we'll follow the normal osmp planning process including participation or coordination with cu uh, oh. Can we say participation of CU and all stakeholders? Yeah, but all stakeholders aren't, 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 part, aren't part of the term agreement. Part of this negotiation. This is CU. Okay. But okay. yeah. Mm. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, you, you know, this is assuming that we're doing a planning process, right, of an access point or an entry point or moving an existing trail or adding a trail on OSMP lands, I'm not so sure why we would signal out CU as, right. as a particular stakeholder that sort of deserves recognition in this, I guess. 
So uh, if I get what well, you're how saying. How about if we say OSMP public planning process? Uh, well, I was gonna do it slightly differently saying the location of trails on OSMP lands and the regulations that apply to use those trails must be determined through normal OSMP planning processes, including consultation with the public and stakeholders. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. The, re the reason that you put CU in there is what Hal was saying before, is that they're the negotiating partner, they're the property owner, they're the, 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 they're the entity upon which we're focused on this particular issue. Yeah, that's fair. So I don't think we can, we can just say, you know, uh, you know, public participation. I think we ought to acknowledge CU so that they feel that you know, there, there is some official role for them uh, in the process. What about, so, Dave, about, Dave, what about the, uh, adding the Kurtz, including CU, you know, yeah, yeah, no, that'd be and fine. stakeholders, including CU. Right, no, that'd be fine. So, so the way I had it until three seconds ago, um, <laughs> the regulations that apply to the use of these trails must be determined through normal OSMP public planning processes including consultation with, and I was gonna say the university to call it out specifically. But yeah, we've said public planning processes, including consultation with the university. Is that sufficient? That works for me. Karen, we need to go back to you because this was yours to start with. Okay, the, the point of, the point of the first uh, part of the sentence or the first sentence, if it was broken apart, was because that's uh, an issue for CU that's pointed out in the existing term sheet. So I understand that you all want to eliminate reference to the uh, various trails and multimodal access in the PUB and PKUO areas. And that's okay with me if you don't want to consider that. And then I think what you have for for the sentence under number six trails is location of trails on OSMP lands and the regulations that apply to the use of those trails will, will be term, determined through the normal OSMP public planning process. Including consultation with the university including, st well, you had had including public and stakeholders, including CU. Yeah, I, I simplified it because I had public planning processes, including consultation with the university. Can I make one suggestion and option yeah. given that it's in the term sheet is we just yank the whole piece. Uh, well, one thing is that we, we, we can't rely on the term sheet as as if it were the annexation guidelines that all parties had agreed to. Fair it's enough. a document in flux. So yeah, there's no agreement on the trails part if you read the details. It's okay. It's a standoff. And and I think this is an issue of import for the board. And oh, okay, Karen. So um, we had the location of trails on OSMP lands and the regulations that apply to the use of those trails. And I'm going to say the word must. I, I don't want to say will because we don't know if it will. We're recommending to council that it must. Must be determined through normal OSMP public planning processes, including consultation with the university. That's fine. Okay. Now, Leah, I'm going to read that one last time. The location of trails on OSMP lands and the regulations that apply to the use of those trails must be determined through normal OSMP public planning processes, including consultation with the university. She's nodding. Yeah, I, I've got that. Is that gonna be the full? That's the full. That's all of number six, period. Okay. <clears throat> Now that we've worked our way through all of these things, I need to go back uh, and ask Caroline, um, what do you think? <laughs> you, you raised some pretty broad issues in your 
concerns. And the question is, have we addressed the concerns sufficiently? I think that a lot of what we are talking about relates a lot to um, the 30 or 34 acres of sports and what that can bring to the area. Um, you know, I always say that I want my children to be able to be grown ups and enjoy open space and, you know, get to be a, a grandmother here and see it. <laughs> and, um, you know, expansion is just what is going to happen. So I think, um, you know, if you've lived in Boulder for 30 years, you know, I've lived here too. So if you've lived here for 30, you probably have seen how projects start maybe small and get bigger and bigger. So it's, it really is just for the protection of open space and what the community of Boulder wants for it down the road. So today it might be a collegiate cross country field and in 30 years, it will not be that. Yeah. Can I just comment back quickly on that? Yeah, now, please. Caroline, the way I reconcile this is that the department has been clear that if we can get the outcomes that we've been uh, sort of enumerating, that they feel that it is um, a, an opportunity for open space to really make good on a larger South Boulder Creek drainage restoration plan. And I just worry personally that um, going into that level of specificity on a private landowner's usage has the potential to be something that would undo something that the department has, has basically stated is valuable. And so I just, I just worry about it. It's not that I don't agree, but I just worry that it jeopardizes the negotiation. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything I said and I agree with everything that you said. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things that it's, you know, and, and I think that the issue is um, what I've, I've heard council express and what I read in the terms is that there's just not a lot of open dialogue. So it makes it really difficult to know um, the terms that'll be presented. You know, it, it starts as one thing. And then since we didn't come to really um, good specific outcomes, a, a state, you know, a stadium does start getting built. I, th I think you're talking about annexation creep. So, um, I mean, we, it, it, it's a lot. It's, it's a big um, statement, but um, again, I'm just trying to think of the the future of open space and, and what that 30 or 34 acres will turn into. Um, and, and just knowing what the, the traffic will, will do, um, you know, and again, what we're supposed to do with our charter and, and protecting um, open space while we're on the board. But I, I see what you're saying, Hal, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a lot to, to add in there. I mean. Oh, I'm, I'm okay. gonna ask Phil Kleisler if he, wants to say anything about this. It's a very tough issue to get your arms around. So, Phil? Yeah, no, the, the thing that um, perked my ears was the stadium. And so I can definitely confirm that there's not gonna be any of those sorts of things happening. But I think the question then will be the nuances around the definitions about what's not going to be allowed. And so my hope is that there'll be some more specific language we'll be able to get out um, out to the community and out to the board um, in the near future that will include those definitions and include some specific ways to, to know that we're gonna get what we think we're gonna get. So. I mean, I don't have any particular uh, reason to say that we shouldn't have a statement in there that we have concerns about uh, the development of athletic fields on, on the property as they uh, as the potential impacts on adjoining open space and you know at least identify the concern and we might not you know have any specific uh, issues right now but at least we've identified the concern and we could even say that we we think that more appropriately the, the open areas uh, on the developed part of the pro property should be 
parts or something like that. And, and just uh, about our financial future and sustainability, if, if a problem that we can't foresee now comes from it and we can't afford to fix it. Yeah, that gets a little funky, but yeah. Uh, no. I'm, I'm trying to come up with a sentence uh, for your issue here, Caroline. Um, I mean, like we're all saying, it's, it's exactly like what Hal's saying about the trails. You know, it, it's nice to be able to have dialogue, um, you know, because open space is so important to Boulder and it would be nice to have that community partnership um, and to have some cohesiveness with the values that we're trying to um, share as, as all members of the city. So that's, that's the part that, um, worries me and where I feel like I just need to do my part, which is follow the charter and say this could have really big potential impacts for open space. And since we don't have a lot of good working dialogue as of now with CU, it, it makes me want to speak of it. And so how, Caroline, how would you describe what you don't want to have happen on those 30 acres in so terms of open space values and interests? What I had written here was um, research findings presented by staff detail underwhelmingly inadequate resources and finances for high risk expansion without value added and meaning societal, societal partnership. So again, it, it, I know it's a lot, but um, I, I feel like everything that we're talking about, again, with student housing and student buildings are just different than the possibilities that could happen with 34 acres of mm -hmm. see what happens. So um, I'm trying to create a sentence then. And, and why I would see you want to limit themselves and what they're able to do with other um, big comparable universities to what? Go ahead, Karen. They're not going to want to lim limit what they do. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't benefit them and it's, it's a huge um, area of revenue. So it well, uh, the only thing I'll say on the university's behalf is that every sport except football and men's basketball loses money for the university. Um, lacrosse doesn't make money for them. Soccer doesn't make money. And so I, I don't see it as a revenue issue. I do see it as a, well, let's see, where can we put this issue, you know, that they will always try to maximize the use of their lands for whatever purposes. So um, what if we said that the OSBT remains concerned about the ill-defined nature of activities on the PUB lands or something like that and the potential for increasing open space impacts over time, something like that. Mm -hmm. Can anybody help me out here? Dan, can I totally put you on the spot and ask if there's anything off the top of your head with concerns for um, the sports being there? Is, is there something that sticks out to you or is it not as much of a concern as maybe I'm? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the boards addressed the lighting, the boards addressed the sound. Originally, CU is, and still could be asking for the 30 acres to go on the OSO. We basically said not on the OSO. Um, I think it's clear that they've, I don't know if they would consider it a deal breaker, but. Uh, having sports fields either at this location or we find them another suitable location is something that they stand by. So um, I think from a negotiation standpoint, if you all want to kind of put in more of a sentence like Kurt referenced is fine. I just don't know what that does from a specific term sheet sort of point uh, negotiation standpoint but it provides context um, I mean, it, um, to where the board's coming from. So I guess it could have that value. Uh, in terms of 
um, you know, them doing something where all the runoff then goes onto our property. I mean, I think you get into, and Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, or, or even Brandon, but some stormwater management issues. I mean, I don't think you'd be able to just do whatever you want on your property and it's just all going to run over to your neighbor's property, whether that's, you know, how realistic that is. Um, so I think the question for the board right now is, is do you want to just have a context setting or do you actually want to have a specific term that you are uh, uh, trying to guide negotiation on? But I'm trying to come up with a general statement. Um, and and I, I am sympathetic to Hal's view that uh, we're asking for all of the OSO. And we have to be a little careful about now what we try to tell them they can or can't do on their remaining property. Um, I think it's fine for us to define our interests and ask that steps be taken to not impact our interests off that property. Um, but I am a little worried about overreach. Um, we've, we've said we don't want nighttime lighting and we don't want amplified sound systems. Um, what if we just added that we remain concerned about the lack of definition on the range of activities on this property or these lands. And, and the risk of, of huh. uh, expansion of... And how about we said an increased impacts on open space? From future development. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let me try reading this. We're, we've just finished saying, it says the university has multiple venues on its existing campuses for musical events and sports competitions that require amplified deleted, sound and or nighttime. We deleted that, what you're reading. That's been deleted. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so it just ends by saying CU South should not be used for these types of activities. The OSBT remains concerned about the lack of definition of the range of activities on these lands and in, and I'm gonna say potential and potential increased impacts on open space from future developments. That's probably too wordy, but that's the idea. And that would be added to the end of our section on minimizing noise and light pollution. I'm happy to read it again if, um, if you'd like. We, the last sentence was CU South should not be used for these types of activities. The OSBT remains concerned about the lack of definition of the range of activities on these lands and the potential and potential increased impacts on open space from future developments. I think that sounds pretty good. It's a general expression of concern and it recognizes we don't know everything we would like to know. Right. Say, now, Leah, say yeah, the ahead, words Karen. that come after the range of... Uh, I'll read it all again. The OSBT remains concerned about the lack of definition of the range of activities on these lands and potential increased impacts on open space from future developments. Can we stick in the words recreational uses because that's, it's, it's the- Should it say the, the range of recreational uses rather than activities, is that what you're saying? Maybe range of recreational uses than other activities? Yeah, I was afraid recreational uses might be too narrow. That's what I, yeah, that's why I wanna have other uses, but- Well, but we say right now, we say that the, the lack of definition of the range of activities on these lands. You could say especially recreational use. 
Well, I think we're more worried maybe about some other uses we don't even know about. Um, that's why I just kept it general, the range of activities on these lands. But what would you like, Karen? The, the general statement leads me thinking all the way from people walking around to God knows what. Um, and what started this concern was, was the, was uh, the item number 11 on the term sheet, which talks about suitable recreational uses for the area. Um, that could include rock concerts. Well, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I mean, <recreation>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, what if we said the lack of definition of the range of allowable activities on these lands? We, we haven't defined what is the range of allowable activities on these lands. You want me to read it again? The OSBT okay. remains- Everybody, everybody listen, this is the final reading. <laughs> well, the OSBT remains concerned about the lack of definition of the range of allowable activities on these lands and the potential increased impacts on open space from future developments. We could replace developments with uses because development sounds too much like buildings, but we could say from future uses. And or developments. Well, I don't think we want to imply that developments. I would use development as a singular noun rather than plural. Right, and, and we've, already, we've already highlighted use, so I think it's worth uh, acknowledging uh, potential from development as well. R really? Okay. Okay. All right. I mean, some of these activities yep. are going to require development. So. Right. Yep. That's a good point. Okay. Uh, Leah, one more time. The OSPT remains concerned about the lack of definition of the range of allowable activities on these lands and the potential increased impacts on open space from future development. She's nodding. And I'd love to see her nod. And, and uses, future, future uses and development. It's both the future use, uses okay. that we haven't even conceived of and development. Okay, uses and development, and future uses and development. Did you get that, Leah? She's nodding, great. Okay, anything else, folks? I think it's a good, I think it addresses a significant area of uncertainty that I think is worth highlighting for council. I agree. Okay. Um, thank you, Caroline. Yeah, thank you, Caroline, for bearing with us on this. <laughs> Will there? Um, well, maybe this is um, a question. Oh, am I on mute? Sorry. No, maybe this no. is a question for Dan. Dan, if, if they, um, if the city during the agreement decides, um, is there much retention area? I know that I think all of this would be utilities. Like the draining and detention and all of that, that's like utilities. They wouldn't say that that's our, our land and we had to worry about that, right? Yeah, Brandon, do you have any comments about Because it just talks a lot about like management, the that type of thing. Right, that's not us. There we go. Um, so I, I think, Caroline, you're at least uh, the few times I think you've tried to hit it tonight, you're talking about uh, stormwater and erosion control and then permanent stormwater controls associated with development. Is that right or am I missing that? No, I think you're right. I'm just reading down. I just want to make sure that none of this has anything to do with our property as I'm reading it. Yeah, and there's requirements for development related to stormwater quality and stormwater control, and then the ultimate 
ultimately the flood mitigation project addresses more of the hundred year flood flows. Um, so they're probably two separate issues and we just have our boulder uh, design and construction standards related to development and how you address water quality. Okay, if I think of, of anything else, I'll, I'll email. Okay. Uh, what, so, about, so Brent, what about Brent, things I was gonna like do... fertilizer and irrigation of, of athletic fields? Runoff. Yeah, so runoff, I guess um, it falls into water quality. So it's managed under our MS4 permit. So um, we do have design and construction standards related to design of detention basins and things of that nature that kind of address water quality controls. And it's not specific to identified pollutants, but just more general stormwater quality. So really talking about water quality control or uh, the water quality capture volume design, things like that. Um, and it applies to runoff from normal irrigation maintenance rather than just storms, right? Uh, it's runoff. I don't know if it addresses irrigation maintenance for sure, because I deal on the stormwater flood side, um, mm -hmm. but it would address impervious area. So that's really how that's calculated is change from existing conditions, um, increased runoff from increased impervious area. So not sure I can answer necessarily exactly on the fields. Uh, I think, uh, Karen, that open space would want to look carefully at the boundaries, though, uh, to make sure we're protecting any of our restored areas uh, from, uh, as you say, fertilizer runoff and things like that. But it may fall outside of the city's stormwater regs. Yeah. Are we to the point, and Karen, this is to you, um, do we want to have um, Leah put the revised motion up for all of us to look at? When would you like to read the whole thing since my voice is shot or have Leah read it or whatever? Um, are you saying we need to read the whole thing into the record or are you saying? Eventually we will, but you may just want her to put everything up so that people can take a look at each section. Uh, it's, it's up to you at this point since you're managing the motion. Well, if we have to read it into the record as one of the steps of what we're doing, we might as well do that while we're reviewing the contents of it, right? That would be fine. So, that, so Leah, can I, you put it in? You know, Karen, I would suggest you read it because you're going to notice a problem perhaps sooner as the author of much of it. What do you think? It's too small for me to read. <laughs> Karen, if you're tired, I'm happy to. to I'll, read. I'll be glad to read it. I, okay. Okay, for uh, me. Make it as big as you can, Leah. The title is OSBT recommendations to council or to city council regarding terms of the CU South annexation. Perfect. And then uh, we're gonna put what's in brackets in a footnote and put an asterisk at the end of each bracket with the term numbers in it, right? That's my memory. Got it, okay. OSBT recommends that the following items in the annexation term sheet that specifically impact OSMP be addressed prior to council action on the annexation terms for CU South. Most derived directly from previous OSBT motions describing mitigations for the variant one South Boulder Creek flood control. Project, it Project. should say. Yeah, it needs to yeah. have the project after. Thank you, Leah. Good. Which utilize CU South OSO lands and therefore could be affected by annexation negotiations. Others are directed at potential features of a CU South development, which are not yet defined, but which could significantly affect OSMP resources and the state natural areas, high quality ecosystems, or the enjoyment of these resources in natural areas by the public. 
This list addresses only annexation related questions. The OSBT expects to provide an update to motions related exclusively to variant one design, construction, mitigation, and operations at a later date. Number one, land for restoration to offset impacts of variant one. As stated in previous motions, restoring and reconnecting the entire OSO acreage on CU South, 119 acres, back to the South Boulder Creek floodplain is a critical requirement to offset variant one impacts. Thus, we believe the entire OSO parcel must be transferred to OSMP ownership. Restoration of these lands will also require removal of the existing levy. Um, what was I gonna ask about that? Oh, Dan, it is 119 acres, is that right? Yes. Okay. Two, transferred costs of floodplain restoration. The OSBT is concerned that the university's previous decisions to separate the OSO land from the floodplain by creating a larger permanent levy, by draining these lands, and by not just restoring these mined lands as originally required, have all dramatically increased the ultimate costs of floodplain restoration and shifted the costs onto the city, including the open space OSMP. This directly reduces the amount and quality of floodplain restoration that can be accomplished by OSMP with existing resources. Does it need to say by the city and OSMP with existing resources or? Uh, you could even strike OSMP. You can just say uh, uh, accomplished with existing resources. Fine, okay. Thanks, you Leah. Bet. For, for these reasons, the OSBT believes that the university should convey the OSO lands to the city and OSMP at no charge in order to ensure the feasibility of the flood control project and the reintegration of these lands with the floodplain. In return, the city slash OSMP would make available whatever portion of those lands is needed for the mitigation of any impacts of the university's CU South development on listed species and wetlands in the PUB area. The university will fund the mitigation work for their required mitigation acreage. However, OSMP would coordinate that work with the larger OSO floodplain restoration effort. Um, one little thing, we refer to university with a big U and a little U, and I'm not yeah. sure it's done pro some, you'll check that Leah, right? Okay, next page. Three, water rights to support floodplain restoration. The OSBT recommends the transfer of the title of the CU water rights associated with the CU South property to the city at no cost for OSMP purposes. And there's a period, no period there, but thanks. Protect four, protecting the South Boulder Creek view shed. Views to the west of the South Boulder Creek Trail are from. a major. Views to the west from the South Boulder Creek Trail. Thank you. Views to the west from the South Boulder Creek Trail are a major feature of this landscape. The OSBT is concerned that the analysis of impacts of the CU South development on this view shed relies upon the existing levee and the trees along it and the dry creek ditch along it and the dry creek ditch to screen the new development, including buildings to 55 feet. See briefing book PDF page 67, views one and two. The removal of the levee and removal of many of the non-native trees as part of the OSO restoration will make the CU South development much more visible from this entire area. It is critical therefore that the university include landscaping and planning as part of the development of the PUB area to screen the structures and protect this existing view shed. Five, minimizing light and noise pollution from the CU South development. And I'm wondering if it should say limiting instead of minimizing, but let me read through it. The CU South development has the potential to significantly degrade the 
habitat quality, wildlife use, and the visitor experience on the OSMP state natural area by introducing light and noise pollution that does not exist today. Currently, this area is very quiet and has relatively good dark skies, which are both important features of our open space. OSBT is concerned that adherence to only the city lighting and noise ordinances will not be sufficient to protect the special use experience and habitat in the adjoining open space areas. The city should develop specific requirements to ensure the university will prevent light and noise impacts on the adjacent lands, particularly, for example, from nighttime sports lighting or amplified sound systems from nighttime sports lighting or amplified sound systems, which might otherwise be allowed under city codes. CU South should not be used for these types of activities. So my question is, is in the title is minimizing the right word still? I, I think it's as good as limiting, but Neither okay. one is quantitatively defined. Right. Okay, the OSBT remains concerned about the lack of definition of the range of allowable activities on these lands and the potential increase of impacts on open space from future uses and development. That's good. Six, trails. The location of any trails on OSMP lands and the regulations that apply to the use of those trails must be determined through normal OSMP public planning processes, including consultation with the university. Okay, you put a motion on the table. Does anyone want to second it? I can't see people anymore. I'll, I'll second. <laughs> okay, Dave has seconded it. Um, any further discussion before I call for a vote? Um, could you put the board members back up for a minute just so I can see that there's no hands waving at me? Okay, I will call for the vote on this motion. Hal Hallstein. I vote for it. Karen Holway. Yes. Dave Koontz. Yes. Caroline Miller. Yes. And Kurt Brown votes yes. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Leah, thank you for all of your help. We appreciate it. Um, any other remarks before we complete this matter or do people have additional matters they would like to bring up from the board at this time. Any questions on the upcoming agendas that have been listed out for the next? Yeah, Karen, go ahead. I have some questions on, on items that are included in the packet as things that are gonna be coming up in the future. Mm -hmm. um, that I just wanna highlight. Um, yeah. In the poor farm Fort Chambers item, uh, it's clear to me that this is just the first step in letting us know what's going on. Um, but I have uh, two or three things that I'd like to highlight in terms of, of staff work on it. Um, the first one is that when this came before council, um, I guess in 2018, three years ago, um, Mary Young and others spoke loud and clear about the uh, Queen Anne's home and the historic structures and um, wanted to make sure that that uh, Historic Denver was involved and Historic Denver was mentioned somewhere in this memo. I can't see right now exactly where it is. It's but, Historic Boulder. I, I'm sorry, thank you, Historic Boulder. Um, 
but I want to make sure that um, that historic Boulder is consulted and involved. Just knowing that that council expects that, and I think it's a good uh, thing to do from a board perspective as well. Um, and and I'd like to know a little bit more. And this goes back to our discussion about the consultation with the uh, native tribes. Um, I'd like to know more about what OSMP is doing in terms of historic structures on properties in general and um, what, what the status or process is for uh, removal of, pro of structures on open space lands. I know the property that's just south of, uh, is it Baseline, um, was purchased knowing that those structures would, were gonna be removed. But I don't know what the status system-wide is. And, and we mentioned during the tribal consultation discussion, um, the development of a cultural resources plan. I'm assuming that's gonna take at least a few years. And I'm wondering if before that we can have just a brief staff report on what the process is for that determination and that kind of action for, for structures on open space lands? Sure, we'd be happy to follow up with um, something. Um, I think there's two questions in there. It seems like, it, is, is, is there a process or a structure or, or a process for determining historic structures? And then if things get under that historic designation, what, how do we tend to deal with it? But then the other questions are, is what is our process for determining the fate of buildings and structures on OSP lands um, that may or may not be historic in nature? Is that kind of the dual question? It is, thank you. You're always so good at telling me what I was <laughs> trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one, so, of the, one of the reasons for my question is, is properties like uh, the poor farm, Fort Chambers property. Another reason for my question is I've gotten some emails recently from uh, constituents about concerns about rumors of what structures are gonna be taken down or not. and. And I don't know the status of all that, um, but uh, a better understanding of, of how that's done and what goes on would be really helpful, I think. Sure, when we get together for our next agenda, internal agenda meeting, we could talk about who would be the lead and putting something together uh, for that. And uh, we'd be happy to report out on that. And I don't want it to be a big but, project. Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, we, we've, I, we, I've identified and I'll use structures in the terms of more residential structures at this point, not lo loafing sheds. And but so we've had a, a full assessment of all of our structures on open mm -hmm. space, and uh, including loafing sheds and I mean like over 300 separate structures and the conditions of those and and their maintenance needs. So as a way of prioritizing where we need to put it, but we also have gone through or we're, we're nearing completion of an assessment of all of our residential structures and what purpose are they currently serving? Do they have historic nature to historic nature to them? Do they have potential open space use if they're currently vacant or not being used for open space purposes? What's the likelihood that it will become an agricultural tenant, perhaps residence, and what type of time frame? So we've uh, uh, that has been about a year and a half or two year process that the real estate folks have worked on. And, um, and, and so we have a, we, we're starting to have a pretty good sense of, of all the residential structures. How many do we think eventually could be part of our agricultural program, for example? Right. Um, for, for like, uh, for like farm workers housing and yes, yes. Which is identified countywide as a huge need. If we want to have viable agriculture. Yeah, exactly. We've talked about that several times. Yeah. So I would say for the most part, um, in general, and this is not doing the report justice, is that 
when when we could identify a reasonable uh, need to accommodate a, an agricultural residency in there, you know, that's something we probably don't want to get rid of that structure. Um, yeah. So uh, all the structures that we own, we we did not identify very many that would rise to the level of of uh, of disposing of. Um, uh, a lot of the ones we found could be very viable from an agricultural perspective. Yeah. Uh, some of them are historic in nature. Um, some may call for, based on there's no use, that maybe the best use is demolishing them and creating more open space. Um, but we, we actually did not find very many that rose to the level of potential disposal. And of course, if they did rise to that level, that would go through the whole process of board and council. Great. And how soon do you expect that to be out? Well, our main author on that is out on paternity leave. <laughs> so, um, but having said that, there's no, there's no imminent decisions on dismantling or disposing of, of them. Basically, uh, where we're at now is for Andy's agricultural program is sort of prioritizing which ones we feel are next candidates to have an agricultural tenant in. That's sort of right now how we're using the draft report to help determine uh, what sites we might wanna do some upgrades to to get them ready to support our agricultural program. Great, is the draft report available or not? I don't, I think it's just right now it's in more of a spreadsheet reform, so. Um, I can get back to you more on the timing, but certainly the paternity leave will affect that. But um, well, like I said, we'll get together internally and kind of point out on the agenda when we might be able to put something like that and um, get back to you. Okay, great. Uh, two other quick comments on the poor farm uh, memo. Um, I kind of wince when I see the word engagement standing alone. And because in my mind, what we really want is participation. And, and so I kept wanting to say, engage, if you're gonna use the word engagement, how about and participation? Because I really want people to participate. Um, and, uh, and then the other thing, it, it talks about in 2021 doing an inventory and because of, of some of the comments that were made about the nature of the property, I sure hope somebody is doing an inventory that will capture spring migration before it's too late, um, which... Karen? I see Mark. Hi, it's <laughs> still here. Yes, Karen, we, you know, we say 21, but we thought of that. We want to go over the four seasons, just like you're saying. So it will spread over to 22. Okay. I would think some people from Audubon Society or BCNA would be happy to take on the, the volunteer charge of going out there and seeing what's there this spring. Great. Thank you. Uh, are you done, Karen? I see Dave's hand. Yep, go for okay, it. Okay, Dave. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I had a, a couple of questions and suggestions. Um, Dan, as far as the uh, future agendas, um, are, are we planning to have a, a status update of the 2021 work program in the at the next meeting or two kind of to let us know where you know the department is uh, is headed, you know this year, as far as status is concerned, it it strikes me that would be helpful just to kind of give a quick update on okay here's where things stand and kind of where we're headed. Uh, well, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Well, so I mean, our, 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 our somewhat related plans is starting uh, next month and, and, and especially into May, we're going to be providing you with details of what's planned for 2022, um, especially as it relates to the CIP projects. Um, 
so are you asking of those projects that were sort of approved through last year to build on 2021, which one, which project yeah, you made? Sort of, uh, just a quick, quick update of, you know, how things are looking, uh, how we're positioned, are, you know, are we ready to go and can we do kind of what we've, what we've uh, said we want to do? And I think, you know, that would be kind of a nice foundation for the 2022 uh, conversation as well. Uh, and yeah, um, kind of uh, not wanting to muddy the waters that, that Karen maintains so clearly, but um, given the co a conversation on the consul tribal consultations and stuff, it strikes me it would be helpful in kind of preparation for the cultural resource management plan for perhaps uh, folks to, you know, again, let the board know kind of where things are at cultural resource wise and kind of what the, uh, you know, kind of the main targets are for the resource management plan. And so kind of give a, you know, kind of an entree so the board has some sense of yeah, you know, kind of what's going on. I, you know, Karen's stuff is pretty specific, so, and I don't want to um, un unduly complicate things, but it just strikes me that I think it'd be very helpful for the board to kind of get a sense of what the uh, cultural resource management plan, uh, you know, the parameters for that, that sort of thing. Yeah, again, um, it's, it, it's something that hasn't been started, so I... Um... But what I wrote down as, a, as an of interest is a cultural resources program status update, which, and the reason that we will get together as a, we get together as a staff is because right now Christian, you know, would be the lead on that. And his plate is, is really full right now because he's also the lead on getting the consultation right. efforts underway and, and, you know, preparing any time to go in front of the board. It may seem seamless from our standpoint when we, come and give you a presentation, but that's hours and hours of work. And so I know one of the reasons we get together and we pray is like, okay, Christian's tap. We're not going to put him in April, for instance. So I don't want to make any promises of when we could come back on this stuff, but I certainly have them all captured and and uh, we could, we could see when we can put those into the queue. Great. And then the other thing was, uh, I, I don't want us to lose sight of the voice and sight program uh, conversation that we have had. There were going to be some follow up uh, yep. items and things. I think uh, that would be helpful. If, yep. You know, we're, on, we're on that one. I talked to Steve about that uh, uh, today. So uh, we'll be getting back to you on that shortly. Okay. Yeah. And I'm especially interested in, in what's going to be happening uh, to dogs off leash in terms of protecting the ground nesting and shrub nesting birds this spring. Because that in the data that uh, screamed out to all of us as a real management need. And I'm wondering if, if you've been able to identify something that could happen to, to enhance uh, compliance with on leash usage in in identified nesting areas yeah so we, we we did get that uh quite we did get all your questions on on the dogs i think we got back to you on on, on one of them but in looking at this it, it, the question started to turn into more of like how do we how do we respond but how do we find the time to respond back in a meaningful way and it seemed to us that perhaps a uh, a written memo rather than one-off emails might be the better approach. Um, and, and so Steve and I and, and John and Lisa Gonzalo, we're gonna have to put our heads together about how best to get back to you on, on those things. I think Steve started to get back to you individually, Karen, but. Yeah, yeah. but what a, I, I'm not interested in, you know, a huge report, but a, a specific uh, response on the the ground nesting and shrub nesting birds in the in the areas where it's voice and sight for part of the year and we know the compliance 
is only in the 50% range during nesting season, is there anything that we can be doing this spring mm -hmm. to, to protect that resource? Yep. Yeah, we will uh, get back to you uh, with some information on, on what we're thinking in that regards. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Dan, uh, I had a couple other real quick things. Um, in the uh, Poor Farm Fort Chambers uh, memo, it said that uh, we don't think the Fort Chambers site is on the Poor Farm property, but it didn't say whether in fact we think it's on open space. So do we think it's on open space? Um, you know, it's not, it's not definitive. From what we're, from the pieces of information we're able to put together right now, we, we, we think it may be off of open space, but it's, it's, it's a type of conclusion that, you know, we, we definitely don't want to rest our laurels on it's, but we think it might be a little bit south of the actual property line, but we're just not, we're not sure at this point. On that, oh, so right. I was just going to add this. We will be doing as part of what we discussed earlier, there will be like a cultural landscape inventory in, and the historic properties inventory. So that's, we're just, there's some initial findings from Kristen, but we won't be until we complete that inventory and work with the four sovereign tribal nations. That's when we'll be publishing like the absolute findings as it were. So that'll probably take another six or nine months for that to go through the yeah. internet. And the truth of it is we may never know definitive, definitively where yeah. the actual location is, so. Yeah. Until you do an archeological dig. <laughs> Well, the, the, the mining pits might have taken care of that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Uh, thanks. I have one other little thing. We, El Dorado Springs State Park has dropped off of the calendar. Has it yeah. totally vanished or? Mark? <laughs> um, yeah. The Casey just gave us a heads up last week that the, we still haven't had any word on when it's going to come back on the table. Um, so we're still in a holding pattern on that, waiting until the state picks it up again. So we'll let you know as soon as we hear anything, Karen. Thank you. When it comes back, we're going to have to get Kurt back because he will. <laughs> I'll be calling Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cameo, Kurt. <laughs> Anything else or other issues from the board? All right. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank Kurt. You. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Kurt. My pleasure. Take care. It was a great Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. I'll send baby pictures. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I need to see Amelia. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Thanks.